in Southeast Asia. And, uh, the, the, uh, it's not been commensurate so far. And uh, these are, uh, you know, there are several gaps, but I would want to point out the paucity in health workforce. So here we have one oncology.
But obviously, in, in a resource-constrained setting, there are several challenges. First, for AI to work, we need data and large amounts of data. And one of the big challenges is just the data infrastructure is not necessarily there in a lot of these countries. You have to be very innovative to get the data to drive AI models. And sharing of data is still relatively novel. And so just more awareness with, between institutions on collaborating to share data and drive these AI processes is really important. And then cost of data is still very high. It has gone down significantly, but it's still very high um, in, in these settings. Then the second thing is a regulatory framework. Just like every other device or drug in medicine, it has to be regulated. Uh, and AIs and digital health products are uh, relatively novel and a lot of regulatory agencies are trying to catch up with the wave. Uh, there, there are several things that need to be looked at. Obviously, you need to look at safety, you need to look at efficacy, but in terms of artificial intelligence, the goalpost is not usually constant. Uh, sometimes you might have, you might have submitted, uh, you know, product to the FDA or FDA equivalent in these countries. And uh, the, the efficacy might change after a year because of more data, there's more insights. Um, and, and, you know, regulatory agencies have to figure out ways to deal with reporting these changes. Uh, and sometimes it could change for the best or it could change for the, you know, it could, it could um, decline in, in what the efficacy was prior. So, so regulatory frameworks have to be built around these, um, these um, technologies. Uh, multi-stakeholder acceptance, you know, how do the government accept these technologies, how the patients accept it, and, and what the, the health workforce. Um, interestingly, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers did a survey uh, in 20, I believe it was 2018, where they, they, uh, the, you know, they asked um, patients in several countries, in Nigeria, South Africa, the United Kingdom, here in the United States to see what their general acceptance of AI augmented medical care would be. And interestingly, it was low in high income countries. It was about 46% in the UK and here in the US it was about 48%. But in places like Nigeria, India and South Africa, it was way over 85%. And so it shows you that there is a need because obviously when you have access to a lot of doctors, you don't want to have like a machine basically making decisions with your doctors. But when you have a situation where there are very few doctors, uh, people will tend to, at least from this survey, and that's sort of here behind it, um, people will tend to want to accept something that would augment their healthcare. And so already we already have like a positive sign that people are willing to accept it, but we need to do more education and more awareness to all the stakeholders from the healthcare workforce to patients and to governments uh, in, in sort of accepting that this could be, um, this could augment the healthcare system and improve uh, health outcomes. Then, then finally, uh, data diversity and multi-setting validation. As, as I said earlier, uh, data drives, drives the workings of artificial intelligence. And it's very, it's highly important that the data is diverse and is, is validated in, in several clinical settings uh, to, to reduce you know, um, what we call algorithmic bias or reduce uh, inaccuracies in certain demographics of people. Uh, it's very important to be culturally sensitive when building uh, these technologies and, and testing them in different settings. And, and just to give a little bit of an example of what, what I'm referring to, uh, these two images, the image on the right is um, on a Caucasian skin, and this is a cancer called Kaposi sarcoma. It's, it's very uh, common among HIV patients. On the left is the same, is a you know, similar skin lesion, similar cancer, um, Kaposi sarcoma, but now it's on a dark skin. And if you if you if you create a model that trains um, and use data on the right to train um, the the model on identifying Kaposi sarcoma, 
you find out that more likely than not, it may not identify the image on the left. But if the, di the data is more diverse, then the accuracy of, of, that tr of that model will be much higher. So it's very important that we diversify data. And that's why it's important to um, carry out artificial intelligence research in limited resource settings, because a lot of times it might be difficult to just transfer these technologies if they are built outside those settings or if they are never validated in those settings. And this is another example, um, even from a genetic standpoint, like this study, basically they were, they were looking at why African-American women were not compliant to a certain uh, cancer chemotherapy, the toxins. And what was found was that they were not, they had lower compliance compared to their Caucasian counterparts because they had more frequent side effects from these toxins compared to Caucasian. So it's very important Patient reported outcome data is very, very important and diversifying it is very important if you want to, um, if you want to, uh, um, you know, have an AI say predict who's going to have, what, what's the best treatment for this patient that would um, have the least side effects. Uh, having data diversity in those training models is very, very important. And then possible solutions is, you know, um, Funding data, you know, uh, developing data governance and regulation around these uh, products, even if, um, say, a country do not have, you know, applications for approval for digital products, is good to have that in hand because when it would, it's inev it inevitable that those would come to the regulatory agencies and they have to be ready, uh, and obviously training the personnel that is going to be reviewing uh, a lot of these applications in these countries. And then more importantly, having population-based cancer registries, uh, that is hugely important uh, to drive artificial intelligence, to drive policies, to drive everything. Um, a lot of times we have just data from hospital-based registries that are modeled for countries, and that's the best we have, but it can be better. So governments need to fund um, population-based cancer registries to really understand the epidemiology in their countries. Um, and then I cannot overemphasize collaborations and partnerships, especially between academic and research institutions, government and private companies, because there has to be constant research and development around this area, constant validation, and these three entities and more in collaborations and partnerships are hugely important, even having the required amounts of data to, to get the kind of power you need. You need cross academic collaborations within the country and outside um, uh, these countries. And then there should be funding opportunities and grants for, to, to develop a capacity for data science and artificial intelligence. And there should be some level of algorithmic transparency so that uh, patients would trust these decision-making tools and even oncologists and the health workforce in general uh, would understand how uh, some of these um, uh, artificial, artificial intelligence driven technologies make their decisions. And thank you, I'll, I'll be very glad to answer questions um, and it's been an honor, thank you so much. Indeed, thank you so much. Let's give uh, both Dr. Kinsley and Dr. Adams earlier a big round of applause. I mean, really, really interesting breakthroughs in this field. And the great part about that presentation is um, not only is it already happening around the world, it's also possible in developing nations like the Philippines. As Dr. Kinsley has shown, it's already being rolled out in Afri parts of Africa. So yes, it's possible. And this is not science fiction, as I said earlier. So thank you again to our two presenters. We're going to open the uh, forum now for your questions and comments. I already have one that came in, but we'd like to remind everyone that we have the chat box with the Q&A tab uh, on, your, on, your, on your screens, uh, if you're at home, of course. And if you're live, you can feel free to ask questions over here right on the floor. So let's bring back uh, Dr. Adam and uh, Dr. Kinsley on screen. So I think we have a few questions already. And thank you so much to Kara Alikpala and uh, Chris Ansaldran for inviting me here, um, giving me the difficult task of trying to break down all these very technical terms and 
all sorts of jargon. It's going to be difficult, but it's going to be exciting as well. So we're trying to simplify it as possible. And um, Dr. Adam, or, or perhaps Dr. Kinsley, just to simplify things, as we have cancer patients who are watching right now, or those who are really just curious, not doctors, not IT professionals, um, just simplify it just a bit and quickly and visualize it for us. So how does it begin? I mean, from, 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 from screening to getting results, and um, what can they expect if indeed this is already rolled out in a country like, like ours, for example, Dr. Adam or Dr. Kinsley? So there are many different types of technologies possible that can impact all parts of the screening process. Think about, the, let's go through the pipeline screening process and I'll kind of walk through the different kinds of tools that we're considering, the ones that already exist and the ones we're developing. The first step is who is getting screened in the first place? What age do we start getting screened? How did this get scheduled? When's the last time they screened? This process itself is like the screening guideline. And that is something that AI can help shape to make sure everyone's caught as soon as possible. There's no disparity in people getting screened later that makes sense for them. That's like step one. Then you actually get the screening, right? Uh, and there's a question of how was that read? In low resource settings or broadly, like there's opportunities for AI to help with that screening process either via as a second reader or in some assistance or partial automation. There's lots of kind of technologies focused at this part of the problem. Let's say, great, uh, nothing to see here. Come back next time, you go back to the, to the guideline technology. That's one pathway. If there's a cancer diagnosis, then understanding who to biopsy, how to read this pathology slide, to understand what mutations might be present. There's lots of AI technologies in that, all the way through to understanding who might respond to different kinds of treatments. So through this entire pathway and understanding like the, the tricky tasks of understanding who, how should we run the screen process as a whole and how do we actually run that process when someone is in the clinic is many different areas where AI can make a difference. Dr. Kinsley, uh, can you visualize this uh, process for us in, let's say, uh, Rwanda, I believe, or in, in Nigeria where this is being rolled out, where there are very different conditions from, let's say, North America? Yeah, so one very good example I like to give is uh, Chadwick Bosman. I, I don't know if you've heard of him, where he's a, he was a popular yes. uh, in Hollywood, yeah. And unfortunately, he passed on. But Chadwick, Chadwick was diagnosed with colorectal cancer at 39, and he unfortunately passed on at 44. Now, that's, that's one data point, but when you look at it from a broad sense, uh, the median age of diagnosis for colorectal cancer in the United States is 68 years. Uh, if you compare that to Nigeria, it is 50 years. But for the longest time, they've been, they've been starting screening at 50. In the US, the guidelines is to do a colonoscopy at 50, but it was reviewed to 45, uh, 45 years in, uh, I think it was 2019. So you can see that it's very important to uh, sort of look at the demographic specific data point. Um, things things that go into screening guidelines will, will cost effectiveness, you know, what is, what, what will be the rate of overdiagnosis, you know, all those things. Um, and they differ from, from region to region. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where AI can play a role in predicting the best time to screen, either from a regional pers perspective or even from an individual, individualized standpoint, because the demographic uh, data is different, um, the epidemiology is different. So it's, it's hugely important to really understand the data uh, from a disaggregated standpoint, not looking at it just from a you know, one size fit all uh, basis. All right, thank you so much. Let's move and on to-, to Add to that. Yes, Dr. Adam, go ahead. I just wanna briefly echo on this. Like there is, it's clear, we already know that at the very least, uh, demographics makes a massive difference on how it should be influenced by guidelines. There is, as exactly as you already mentioned, this opportunity to go all the way to individual levels. One thing we're working on now is looking at integrating all the available information prior in AHR to understand when likely, when should we start screening at all. And so right now we kind of have like, you, you Google the online policy, here's the guideline for the country, but really should be suited to individual needs. And the only way we can be able to consider these kind of problems is via AI. All right, thank you. Let's uh, move on to this question that came in from, our, well, not our live audience, but from our online audience. And uh, let, let me just kind of paraphrase it a bit. Um, how quickly can this program be rolled out? I mean, is this project, take 
how would this project be set up, let's say, in one hospital? Is it in months? Is it in years? Is it even about rolling it out per, per institution? Or is this a nationwide rollout? Is this a, uh, yeah, what, let's talk about scale here. Um, uh, Dr. Adam, Dr. Kinsey, either one of you. So I can speak a bit about the technologies that uh, we've developed. Actually, Kingsley can uh, give some real world experience in this as well in our collaborations. Uh, so broadly, you know, we're working on bringing this out to a broader audience. We want to do lots of prospective studies that understand all the right ways to use this kind of tool based on the really local clinical context. So we're actively recruiting partners that there is a kind of hospital, or they're basically a group that wants to try these tools and try a new way to use them. They should reach out and we will work with them to make that happen. Uh, how quickly we get there is up to uh, everyone and how quickly we get them together, right? It's not something any one group can kind of do by themselves. Uh, now, can you, you want to add on like the, the timeline that we were? Yeah, so the reason, I, the reason I chuckled is because I, I think I touched part of it in my presentation. It's still relatively novel and even institutional review boards are like, wait, what are you talking about here? You know, and so it takes time to even get an approval you have to sit and you know explain what you're trying to do uh, because it's still relatively novel. And so um, I know Adam and I would love to have these technologies like yesterday um, rolled out, but the truth is, uh, it and the reality is that it takes a process. Um, and and that's why you know I, I I talked about like possible solutions is that countries and institutions should get ready. Like, for example, the institutional review boards, there should be some sort of training on like, okay, how do you um, approve like an AI based research that is not just the traditional, you know, research that they're used to reviewing and approving. So th those kinds of things are, are, are critically important. And obviously, um, you know, just getting the right partners with the right um, skill set, because um, as, you, as you can, as I said in my presentation, there has to be multi setting validation, mm -hmm. because a lot of times when this technologies are built, they are built with a setting, clinical setting in mind, which might be different from another country. And so validating some of these technologies in different countries um, can really lead to widespread usage. And so having the right partners that have the right skill set um, to, to um, support validating some of these technologies is critically important. Um, but I would say that, you know, in, in a lot of low resource settings, for example, in Rwanda, where we're um, working, uh, you know, where Huron AI is um, operating, we're looking at ways to sort of reduce, to, to set the bar lower for scale. So for example, um, using USSD, where there's no smartphone penetrations in, in terms of like patient support tools, like the ones uh, we're building in Rwanda, um, is critically important for scale because obviously uh, in some countries, uh, smartphone penetration is not that high. In, in Rwanda, it's about 30%. In Nigeria, it's about 70%. So, you know, different countries have different resources and they have to be, in, in scaling these technologies, you have to look at it from, you know, the partners um, you're going to be working with, the regulatory framework, mm -hmm. and even just, and, and getting all those multi-stakeholders up to speed with, right. with this technology. But I can see that there's a lot of progress for sure. All right. That's what, so the, the model is available. Uh, technology is available. It's that it's evolving, and it requires much more than just um, um, it, you know take that technology. It requires all sorts of stakeholders. Yes, Adam, you're going to say something. Yeah. So in our experience so far, because we've managed to validate now with uh, quite a few clinical partners, and really echoing what Kingsley was saying, there's so much variance in how ready a partner is ready to actually run this kind of study. The fastest I've seen is like two weeks, we go from talking about it on the phone to having agreements to having validation to understand what the model can do in this population. So like well over a year. And so it really, a lot comes down to how prepared is the institution to be able to access its own data, to be able to, to study these questions. And there's a lot of value in becoming capable to deploy and use these things. Cause they're, you know, they're available. All right. So we, we're down to our last five minutes, and I mean, I'm really excited. There's a lot of questions, actually, even on the floor. I mean, you guys are like, have really, I think, uh, triggered something a lot of us here. Um, Mimi has a question from the floor. Yes. Can we have a microphone for Mimi? Or My question is, this is not a new, th like, what you will do is you will upload PET scans to the cloud, and then this can be... 
uh, analyzed by your algorithm or by your AI? Is it something like that or the x-ray can be just be uploaded or does it involve new machines that can look at the mammogram or so it's supposed to be like it's going to be compared to a big data, right? I mean to, to data mm -hmm. that you have more you have more data, you have millions of data whereas the oncologist or the pathologist or the radiologist in the Philippines for instance would only have access to his experience which may be like 300 patients or 500 patients. Am I correct? Um, yeah, Kinsley, so Adam, me... how does it work? Yeah. Yeah, so the exact model I showed you, like Mirai, the breast cancer risk model, looks at just the mammogram as is regularly collected, right? So like you go get screened to get a mammogram. Uh, we don't have like a, a website. We partner with the clinical site that would they install the model there. So the data never leaves the private environment. And when it goes there, they get that kind of risk prediction. So it doesn't require new kinds of machines or it's installable wherever mammograms are otherwise taken. Now, uh, there are opportunities, you know, there's what my model does and what models can do in general, but there are opportunities to create new kinds of sensing based on AI. There's lots of, you know, we're just crashing the surface here, okay. but we will show you today in depth what stuff looks at just existing images that already exist. Okay, so the, ex the existing screening would, would be fine. For now, that's what we're working with, the, the mam mammograms that are, that are captured in, in, in the clinics. So, but in they, future, they, they, yeah. special screening um, equipment, would be possible for to, to increase accuracy in prediction. Yes, you have a follow-up yeah. question? Yeah, so uh, basically, I think, um, for instance, if you upload PET CT scans, normally a doctor has to sign, a radiologist has to sign for it. So if it's, uh, so hopefully there will be um, policies that will be changed that will not require the signature already of a physician, just the AI will have a certification that is already a uh, you know, PhD in reading <laughs> PET CT scans. I guess so. what Mimi is trying to imply is to simplify and make it more affordable and, and quicker. Uh, is, is that already happening? Or does it still require the same um, professionals to sign off on those screens, on those uh, scans rather? Well, in this case, what we're looking at, uh, so cancer risk models are already calculators that someone is running. So in a way, this is a very similar realm. And it's not like it's uh, replacing what the readers would do. It's supplementing it in a new way. You also look at, is there going to be a cancer to data manage the current exam? Whereas with the models, we're managing a guideline that wants to come back and what other image should possibly be taken. And so this is something that are fully complementary and not against each other. Mm -hmm. Now, there's definitely different challenges in each clinical setting where one deploys. We haven't gone through the local challenges in the Philippines yet, but we would, you know, if someone there would like to collaborate, then, you know, we're here. Uh, and so, uh, but that's, smoothing the guidelines, the regulations, and making sure these tools go through the white path to make sure we all trust them and things are safe is all important part of the process we go from new technologies to impact. All right, we're running out of time uh, in very interesting discussion. So let me just kind of like put a lot of these questions together in a single question, because like this one is talking about what's the minimum number of people needed to start or run such an endeavor. Obviously, a lot of people excited about this and want to get it done immediately. And how much would an investment require, uh, um, Dr. Kinsley? Yeah, so the initial investment is where the challenge is because if you're doing, you, you have to do a lot of uh, validation, you know, the, the training uh, that goes with the models um, can be pretty much expensive because you're, you're gonna be having, you know, to use huge large data space uh, but once you have had the validation and you, you know, you, you've kind of shown data on efficacy and safety and it's approved, um, obviously uh, the cost goes significantly lower. And then if you do like a cost effective analysis on like what was my initial investment uh, in setting this whole process up versus over time, you know, the time it's going to save physicians uh, uh, the increase in diagnostic accuracy and what that does like over time, you'd see that it significantly reduces, it will significantly reduce the cost of healthcare mm -hmm. for sure. And, and we feel that this, these tools uh, would be one very critically important tool in the buckets of improving health equity. Right, let me Especially just Especially with capital, it's already very expensive. Right, let me throw in this question as well, because we have a lot of uh, doctors who are also listening in right now. And, you know, usually when you say AI, usually it displaces the workforce, the traditional workforce. But explain to us clearly, um, 
uh, and specifically, this does not replace the oncologist, right? This, this does not replace the doctors. Um, what is the, but it does in a way, somehow, um, there's an evolution that, that's, that's happening as well with the way doctors function. So give us a, a glimpse of what, this, what these changes may be, if any, between hospitals, so let me, let me doctors, very, and, and their patients, yeah. Yeah, let me, let me give you a very good use case in a typical resource-constrained setting. Let's assume you have this large hospital with huge you know, patient inflow, and you only have one radiologist. If you have an AI system that suggests or predicts what uh, that, that, you know, that uses computer vision to predict what the diagnosis might be. And then you have a radiologist also making a diagnosis. That radiologist does not have any infrastructure for QA. In high resource settings like the United States, there are gonna be discussions about with, you know, with residents, with fellows, you know, discussing a case. But in the case, in, in, a, in a limited resource setting, they might not have that luxury. And an AI might just be that one QA tool that that radiologists have. And so I don't see it as displacing the role of a physician, rather it's going to augment that role. And at the end of the day, the most important variable in, in all this is the patient. If you have a tool that can increase the diagnostic accuracy for say a pathologist or a radiologist, that is gonna have direct outcomes to patients. So I, I don't think at all that is going to uh, displace uh, physicians, but it's going to augment their work and at the very uh, tail end of it, improve patient outcomes. And I know, Adam, you want to add to that. Dr. Adam, just in closing, a uh, similar question. Well, like, walk us through quickly what is happening right now, because change is inevitable. And as much as there might be some reluctance at this point, might be some skepticism about the role of AI, uh, it's inevitable. Uh -huh. What can we expect in the near future? So, one thing I want to know is that, like, you know, medicine is full of making very hard, tricky decisions with really complex information and trying to summarize it to understand, you know, given all we know about a patient, what should we do next to give us the best possible odds of success? And doctors have many tools in their belts to do this. Why we can look at, well, here's what we saw in the literature, maybe this is associated with this, maybe I can think about this treatment pathway. But what AI brings is another type of tool to do very complex data integration to better understand how to make better decisions. So it's not uh, replacing the role of the doctor, it just gives you another way to augment your capabilities and understand there are things that are otherwise too hard to do by yourself. So then when we think about things like cancer risk or personalized screening, this is in that bucket. It's not something that doctors are empowered to solve by themselves today, but this is something where AI can make a big difference. And more broadly, you know, including things like scaling resources in a resource constrained setting, but even resource rich settings, there's a big room for using AI for discovery as a whole. Like you might've seen on the news things like AlphaFold, better fold proteins. There's a lot of, there's a much broader AI for science intersection, where the world is full of hard problems that we can't solve alone. And using computation is a really meaningful way to address these. And this is not an isolation, like it's a clinical design problem that we work together to understand what the problems to be solving to develop the right tools to along the way. All right, thank you so much. Let's give a big round of applause both to Dr. Kinsley and Dr. Adam. Um, clearly, a lot of us are excited about this. I know I'm excited about this, and I, I can tell from the reactions, from the questions that were handed over to me, that there's a lot of excitement as well. In fact, some of them want to start this right now. Um, the model is available, as was mentioned. The technology is available, but it's still a work in progress, and that's been very clear. It requires uh, this conversation to continue, and uh, hopefully we have another chance to, to talk to both Dr. Adam and Dr. Kinsley, uh, and those of you feel free to get in touch with them directly if you want to see how you can actually apply this to your institutions, uh, to your hospitals, or to your own practices. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Kinsley and Dr. Adam. Um, great news, I promise great news on a day like this. Um, we can predict breast cancer much earlier now, more, much more accurately, and most importantly, um, it becomes more accessible to people all over the country. Those who are far from health centers, far from oncologists, radiologists, this is now a way to equalize the situation. Thank you, thank you to, to everyone for listening in. Just a few announcements about what to expect. Uh, in, in the next few minutes. Okay, um, that's right. Um, 
So for our attendees online, please enjoy the virtual photo booths. Uh, we're going to be flashing that in a short while and explore the sponsors' booths as well. This event would not have been possible without our friends who supported this, um, th this conference. So thank you so much. You may log back in and join room number one for the closing ceremony. In the meantime, have a very good day ahead. It's a Sunday. Enjoy your Sunday with your family. And of course, stay safe, everyone. Thank you very much. I'm a project manager at King's College London. Dan saya adalah pengidap. I'm a primary school teacher. Soy educadora de niño. I uh, work for Ernst and Young as senior. It was a mixed bag, bag of emotions. It was kind of exciting because normality was coming back, but it was also very scary because can I do this now? Am I capable? What What is my body going to allow me to do? They said to me, you have to, to leave. So when I started to come back to the house, they said, I'm sorry, if I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, last kali akan mati. I experienced physical and emotional breakdowns. I needed the job. I needed the finance, the salary to help me to pay my bills, my treatments. I needed at least that. I don't know how to find a job that will meet me where I am. I would recommend to any employer to sit with the with the individual, identify the challenges, and address the needs. Living or working with advanced breast cancer, you're more than capable of doing the job with just a little bit of flexibility. Porque el cáncer no nos quita la capacidad de pensar ni de actuar. Potentially, we could have a long time left working. So don't write us off. It is not over until it is over.
Together, enough for nothing to be better. 
Good day, everyone. I'm Nicole de Guzman from the Eye Cancer Foundation and also one of the teachers here at Bikram Yoga, Quezon City. And today we'll be doing chair yoga. It's yoga postures within the confines of a chair. And don't worry because this is very simple, very doable. This is um, something that, you know, everyone can do. The pregnant, the elderly, um, those recovering from illness, breast cancer most especially. Yeah, let's give it a shot for sure. You will find this easy and doable and enjoyable. We begin the class with uh, some breathing exercises. We'll do a couple of breaths, deep inhales and deep exhales. We inhale by the nose and exhale slowly by the mouth. When you inhale, it's like you're using the back of your throat. And then when you exhale, really open up your mouth. Don't be shy and make that H-A sound. It's in. Right? And then simultaneously, when we inhale, we bring our arms up. And then exhale through the mouth, bring your arms down. A couple of breaths more. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Last one. Inhale. And exhale. And since this is chair yoga, the most important thing you would need, of course, is a chair. And for me, it's just a simple mono block. Just make sure that your chair doesn't have wheels or if ever there is or there are, please have it locked so that it doesn't move when you move, all right? And then another thing, as much as possible, if it could have a backrest like this one because we will be utilizing that when we do a certain posture. So have your chair ready. So first things first, how do we sit down on our chair? All right, we go a little bit forward, a little bit in front. So we're not, we don't have our backs on the backrest. We go a little bit forward so that it's just our hips and the upper part of the thighs. And then our feet is planted firmly on the floor. And then we distribute our weight on our hips and our feet all over equally the same. We first start with our feet and our ankles. So it's very simple. We bring our right leg up. All right. And then we start with toes up. And then toes down. Really articulate the toes. Again, toes up. And then toes down. One more toes up. And then toes down. Last one, toes up. And then toes down. It stays there. Okay. And then we rotate it upwards. One, still articulating the toes. Two, and then three, last one, four. And then inwards this time. One, and two, and three, and four. Hold it there for a second and bring that right leg down. If you feel a little bit of a burning sensation on your thighs, that's perfectly fine. It means that you re you are really working your leg. And let's do it on the left side this time. Bring your left leg up. Again, we articulate the toes. We point it towards the ceiling. And then towards the floor. Again, towards the ceiling. Then towards the floor. Breathe on it. Make sure you are breathing. Up. Then down. Last one. Up. Then down. And then we rotate it outwards. One. And two. And three. And four. And then inwards. One. And two. And three. And four. And then hold it a bit. And then bring the legs down. Bring the leg down. Again, a bit of burning sensation. That's perfectly fine. You're doing good. Just pat your thighs a little bit. Pat front and the sides. And for the next movement, we'll be starting to uh, move on our uh, hips and our waist area. Listen very carefully. We put our right hand on the floor, very near the right foot. If you can't reach it, it's too low, then it's okay to go on your fingers. For now, we put it down on the floor and that brings your shoulder very close to your um, knee or against the knee. And while we're there, we turn our head and look up towards the ceiling and reach the left arm up. So we reach up, we reach down, inhale, and exhale. And how do we go up? That raised hand, we put it on our knee and then push yourself up. 
So all the time, safety, no jerky movements. And then let's do it on the other side. It's now the left hand on the floor. Again, if it's not possible, go on to your fingers. For now, we'll put it on the floor, shoulder against the knee. And then twist the body. Look all the way up towards the ceiling on the other side. And lift your left hand up. Reach up. Reach down. With the opening of the chest, breathe into the posture. Inhale and exhale. Raise the hand on the knee and then push yourself up. Let's do it again. Right hand on the floor. Shoulder against the knee. Turn your head. Look up towards the ceiling. If even feel that stretching on the neck. And then raise the left hand up. Reach up. Reach down. Open up the chest and the ribcage. Breathe into the posture. And then change. Put your hand on your knee. And then push yourself up. For the last one. Left hand on the floor. Elbow against the knee. Twist your body, including the head. Look up towards the ceiling. Reach the hand up. Stretch up. Push down. Breathe into the posture and change. Hand on the knee, then push yourself up. And for our final pose, our spine twist, we go forward again the same way we sat down at the beginning. Feet planted firmly on the floor. Let's get our right hand behind us near our hips. Okay, and then the left hand goes outside of the the opposite knee. And then what we do we do? Still with a straight spine, meaning no hunchback, straight spine. We push our hip forward and then we push our knee inward. And then we twist all the way to the back. Look all the way to the back. Still chest is lifted and feel the twisting, the binding, and still the stretching. Give it a breath. Inhale and exhale. And then carefully get out of the posture. Go back to the neutral first. And let's do it on the other side. Your other hand on your hip. And then the other hand on, on the opposite knee. Still chest is lifted. And all the way, look to the back. While you're here, if you can, give yourself that extra stretch by pushing your hips more forward. And then pushing your knee towards the center and then feel the stretch inhale and exhale carefully get out of the posture and go back to neutral one more time hand at the outside of the knee other hand on your hip still chest is lifted and spine straight like a corkscrew twist all the way to the back give yourself that extra stretch by pushing your knee inward and your hip forward Chest is lifted, chin away from your chest, look all the way to the back, and breathe into the posture. Slowly and gently, hands on your throat. Last one on the left side. Hand on the hip, other hand against the other knee. Chest is lifted, spine is straight, twist all the way to the back. Open up the chest, probably some cracking on your spine. Inhale and exhale and change. So get, get into the posture, go back to neutral and breathe on it. Inhale and exhale. Now we get into the Sabasana. Still we utilize a chair. Okay, It's our resting pose already. Many things you can do here. If you're near your couch or your bed, just lie down. That's perfectly fine because this is Sabasana anyway. But if you want to utilize the chair, this is a very simple savasana as well. You probably put your chair on the side or just go in front of it and sit down. Sit down as most, the most comfortable position that you can. And then wherever you are comfortable, put your hands on the chair and then drop your head down. You can stay here for as long as you want. And really relax yourself and enjoy the benefits 
of the chair yoga that we just did. Thank you for sharing your chair yoga practice with me. Namaste.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the 6th Southeast Asian Breast Cancer Symposium. Now, to kick off our closing ceremony, let's give a warm round of applause to Ms. Bibet Orteza. There. It's me again. Your favorite sex symbol. Um... Okay, I hope you had a good lunch, a great lunch, because we have something wonderful for all of you now. We will go into stories of hope. As breast cancer survivors, we use different, we have different ways of coping. We have our sense of humor, like for instance, the day before I was going to have my first chemotherapy, I was going to go see my, de my dentist. And um, I, I was wearing a rather thin shirt. And my two nipples were kind of showing. So my husband said, Mama, I can see your two nipples. And I replied, Papa, today is my last day to have two nipples. Can I show them off? Okay. And then we also get words of encouragement from our family. Like when I was mulling over chemotherapy, my son said, Mama, you will get well. I said, what makes you say that? He said, because the word mother is embedded in chemotherapy. It's actually chemotherapy. These things we use to get through and we realize that a breast cancer diagnosis it's not a death sentence. It's actually just like getting a front row seat to the first night of your wake. Considering that we all go anyway, we just realize that there's time for us to know who will feel bad when we will go, who will want to hold our hands as we make the journey, I mean, with all due respect to people who just kill over and, and pass, at least we have time. We have time as cancer uh, warriors. So we proceed and go on. I used to say, that when you're a breast cancer uh, warrior, you realize that hope springs eternal from the human breast even when the human breast is one. So now, to start with you for our first story of hope, is someone whom I had seen almost practically naked on stage for two of the plays that she did at the University of the Philippines. So I really did see her two breasts. Um, let's please welcome the grammar Nazi, Alia Onasan. Diba? You join a select rank, the uh, bet of people who have seen my breast. Oops. Anyway. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alia. I'm, a, I'm 10 years next year, survivor. So, you know, it, parang it was just yesterday because I've been, I'd been writing. I'm a journalist. I'm an editor. Uh, I've been writing about uh, breast cancer long before I got it. So, of course, my, one of my first calls was to Kara, a good friend. Her mother was my mentor and one of my favorite people on earth, yeah. Uh, uh, editor Leti Magsanok. So I told Kara, Kara, guess what? It's me. <laughs> and then, of course, I, 
nothing prepares you. Theoretically, you know, no, what's going to happen. But you, nothing prepares you. But uh, she was there on my first day of chemo, and uh, uh, I told myself that I would uh, fight. I would focus on the fight, and I would tell God, "Okay, I'm not gonna get mad at you, but you take care of me." So He did. So I'm fine. But I have a special uh, topic to discuss because um, I'm special. I have ice cream. <laughs> I have ice cream on my head. No. Um, even before I was diagnosed with cancer, I was diagnosed with clinical depression. I've been clinically depressed since since uh, the 90s, since I was born. <laughs> since I was born. <laughs> please stop heckling the crowd. Please stop. This is serious stuff, no? Okay, no. But uh, I was diagnosed with clinical depression. I had several rounds. I had been seeing a psychiatrist and. It was, I think it was God's timing that I was already headed for another episode when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And then when I got breast cancer, I was so focused on getting well that I was preoccupied. So I was, you know, I was the type who would, I had these grippers before chemo para lumabas yung maugat, so that my veins would pop out, you know. And then I would, uh, I shaved my head because I believe uh, when you're bald, you realize how beautiful you are. And I was convinced I was beautiful. So I shaved my head ahead of time. Stuff like that. But um, the real journey, uh, the real uh, clincher was after I got well, which is where people least expect it. In the Philippines, no, we're Catholic. Oh, she's well, she's fine. She'll be, you're okay, great. Everybody goes back to life. And then you're sitting there. Your, your worldview has been turned on its head. Everything that you thought that was important is not so important. Or maybe it's got a new, there, there's a new take on things. So you're sitting there. You're at a crossroads and nobody kind of gets it. So that's when I got depressed again. That's when I had another episode. So I was standing there wondering what life meant. <laughs> I was driving again, and then I had to park. You know, you know, dramatic part. If you're going to make a movie about my life, you, you, know, you have to shoot that part where I park in White Plains Avenue, and I cry because I can't continue driving. And I don't know why. why you know? So I was guided to a psychiatrist who was also a cancer survivor. And we were able to... And, are, we started at that place, uh, that place of being kind of lost and not knowing what to do with the rest of your life when you should be grateful. So you're not great, you're not completely grateful, so you feel ungrateful. It's a very complicated, very complicated emotion. So we kind of processed that. And then I was also able to enlighten some of my doctors that, you know, this is serious. When you're well, you're not necessarily well. There are things to uh, reassess, no? And I, I'm... I'm not glad that more people have mental health problems, but I'm glad that we're talking about it. And then the stigma is gone because when I started getting medication, in the 90s, Prozac was 98 bucks a pop. So that was very expensive. Uh, and then I would experience things like uh, a medical exam where they would ask you, mom, what medication are you taking? So then I'd tell them, I'm Prozac. Are we going to write that? Let's not write that anymore. So it's like, you know, why? I'm nuts. Okay, so, you know, I'm like this. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It's a, it's a, of course, the findings now, it's a combination of a predisposition. There's a little bit of genetics. There's a little bit of a, a trigger trauma. But there's also, it's very physiological. You're, uh, uh, if you're going to use the cell phone analogy in the Philippines, sometimes your brain synapses are choppy. That's what it is. You know, they don't quite communicate properly. But it's a combination of factors. So, and we have to realize that that cancer is a pretty ideal trigger to uh, put you in a spot, not where you're sad, but where you have to rethink things. And there's a lot of uncertainty. So I was able to tell, especially my breast, uh, my breast surgeon that, you know, and uh, Dr. Michelle Oye, and in fact, right now, whenever she talks to younger doctors, she tells them that, uh, she, tell, she told me herself that she was able to discuss with the younger doctors, please be on the lookout for uh, this kind of situation in your patients, no? Uh, because it happens. There's, there's, uh, there are mental health issues from the beginning, which is obvious, in the process, which is obvious, but uh, you have to watch out for when the whole thing is over. So mental health is an issue. Mental health is a huge part, as we now realize, of total well-being, and total well-being has everything to do with your health in general, no? Okay, fighting cancer is a battle. So if you're if your body is fixed, but your mind is not, you know, I, I was once asked, anyway, I'll make this a little bit of a tribute to my psychiatrist who passed away last October after seven years of fixing me and saving my life. I say saving my life because we dug up issues which I didn't realize were issues, no? And that's the hallmark of a good psychiatrist. She's not afraid to dig up things that 
you can't confront by yourself. I'm an advocate of going to a psychiatrist. I'm an advocate for medication if you need it. Don't be afraid of it. Uh, supervised. No? Don't pop it like paracetamol or a painkiller. No? Uh, if it's supervised, it can save your life. I have been an advocate for this for a while. And I have received messages on Facebook. I have received uh, texts, emails of people who would listen to a talk. And they decided, now maybe she's not so bad. Maybe I can take medicine. And they have said these words so many times. You saved my life. It's a huge responsibility, I feel. But I think I didn't do anything extraordinary except tell people that don't be afraid of medication. My doctor told me, you know, don't suffer because you can. Her exact words were, be easy, take it, be, be nice to yourself, you know. And then you can take medication. Some, it's not always going to work the first time. Sometimes you have to do trial and error for a few times to find the right combination for you. And sometimes you'll have negative reactions, but you just have to persevere. You shop just the way you would shop for, a, for an oncologist or a, physical, a doctor for more physical illnesses. You shop for, your, for the psychiatrist you get along with and the kind of medication you need. No? So, uh, so it's a tribute to her. I, uh, she passed away last October after saving my life. I'm on maintenance medication, but I haven't had to talk to another psychiatrist since. So I like to think that my brain has been kind of fixed or I know what's wrong with me or I now see everything. But uh, it's still my advice for people going through cancer. If you're feeling sad uh, for an extended time, don't be afraid to ask for help. No, Hindi, That's not, pardon the Philippines, it's not arte, it's not drama. You're not being, uh, you're not being weak or facetious. It's not a... Uh, character we uh flaw you're not less of a person because you cry so much and you feel sad and you're concerned you're not less of a person it's a normal reaction no and then you can get help during that while you feel these things and if it extends it becomes clinical depression you can still get help you can still get better you can still become productive i think i dare say i will challenge uh, kara to counter me i dare say i've been productive despite everything that I've gotten sick with. And I still dream of a day when I write a book about living with breast cancer, depression, and other gifts. Other gifts, no? One of the, and if I may add to, just to conclude, if I may add to what Bibet said, it's not a death sentence. In my case, cancer has proven to be uh, something else. It's actually been a new lease on life. It actually made me see how important things are. I mean, I would not have, we, we got asked once, uh, what would you do differently? I don't know, really. I probably wouldn't do anything differently because if I didn't get cancer, I would not have understood my depression. If I did not get depression, I would not have been able to handle my cancer in that way. So everything in life happens for a reason. It's just how you move forward. Uh, you have your team to help you, but the main uh, fighter here is yourself. So there's no stigma. Never mind what... The people who say that if you are... If you have a mental problem, you're... You're, you know, you're sick or you should be avoided. They're unenlightened. They know nothing. And they have nothing to do with your life. So, you know, so just don't be afraid to confront it. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to get medication. And uh, you'll be led to people who will help you. And uh, life goes on and life becomes even better. So thank you very much. Thank you for that inspiring message, Kara. Uh, <laughs> Alia, uh, two letter A's in your name. Okay. Four letters each. What do you want me to do? You know, I'm 68 years old, even if I look like 45. Um, okay. Um, we have various ways of dealing with the situation. When I got diagnosed, I was 50 years old. And uh, at that point, I had already perceived uh, of myself as a retired activist, as after all, I was an activist in college. And um, I had already been active in the anti-censorship fight in the film and television industry where I belong to. But when I was diagnosed with cancer, I realized that I wasn't just going to sit and wait for death to get me. I was to going to get involved all the more, and that's what I did. Um, 
days after my last chemo, my last, um, my hair still not grown back, I was emceeing a rally in uh, along Makati and my oncologist and my surgeon were calling me and said, you're not yet allowed to be on stage screaming all your vitriol out. If you don't go down right now, we're going to send an ambulance to pick you up. So I backed off. But I'm here as all my breast sisters are in the thick of the fight. We hold each other's hands. Here in I Can Serve, you see different kinds of warriors. Now here to present uh, her story is someone who's new to the group, someone who's shy like me. Um, I'm serious. That's, that's not a joke, okay? Um, and you laughed, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Let's please welcome Sheila Gagi. Hi, uh, I'm Sheila Gagi. I'm 41 years old. Uh, I'm a mom of two and I am a triathlete. Um, I got diagnosed last May 2020, stage two triple negative breast cancer. Um, I was just busy training with my triathlon. So triathlon is um, swim, bike, and run. I, I finished my first full Ironman last 2018 here in Subic. And <laughs> thank you. And my second one was in Vitoria, Spain. So I was training for a back-to-back -back Ironman, supposedly um, in May 2020, and then a Berlin Marathon. Uh, a full Ironman consists of 3.9 kilometer swim and 180 kilometer bike. Um, it's like 180 kilometers is like uh, from Manila going to Ilocos, so biking that all the way, yeah. And <laughs> a full marathon of 42 kilometers. So um, in March 2020, while I was taking a shower, I felt a small lump on my left breast. I went to Cardinal Santos Hospital. Um, I had it checked with an OB and then she said, um, don't worry too much, it looks benign because um, the edges um, were like smooth. Um, and then to come back on um, Monday so we can have mam mammogram and ultrasound. So. That Sunday, I went for an aquathlon race, and then I went for a, for my kids' recital. So come Monday, I went to the hospital, and and then there was this news of this Muslim, um, Muslim guy, who who they brought to a uh, uh, um, Cardinal Santos. He was tested positive. He he was like I think one of the first few who tested positive and was brought there. So I got scared. So um, I said, okay, I'll just come back maybe next time since we didn't know what COVID-19 was. Um, and then um, I'll just wait for the situation to pass. But days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months and then they declared pandemic. So two months after, I felt the lump gotten bigger. I got worried and I had it checked. On May 12, that's Wednesday, that's, I can't forget that um, date because it was my husband's birthday. He said, okay, let's just go to a uh, surgeon so we can just get over with it. So uh, we did an ultrasound. The, the surgeon, the second um, surgeon said, oh, it looks benign. So you can celebrate, go home and celebrate it it's since it's your husband's birthday. But we, we did a core needle biopsy. Then come Friday, I received a message from the clinic that I needed to come in on Monday. So I knew something was wrong. Everything went black. After hearing those words, you tested positive for breast cancer. My world stopped. I didn't know what to feel. I didn't know what to do. What, what, what should I do? <laughs> Usually you're, you'll hear it from your mom and dad's friend, like, oh, your tita, your auntie has it, or my friend has it, or a friend of a friend has it. But, not, but it's never you. And now it's me. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I was at my fittest. I don't drink. I don't sleep late because uh, training starts in the morning. So, and then, the, and then this. So um, there's 
not a particular degree of difficulty. We can put in words when you get diagnosed with cancer, no matter what stage or what type it is, your world will just seem to fall apart. So um, I was at my fittest when I had got diagnosed with cancer and in a snap, my health was taken away from me. Coming from a person who was rarely sick, who doesn't even go to the hospital and doesn't drink medicine when, when you're sick, who just did Ironmans and Spartans and gymnastics, <laughs> who would have thought? Well, it was really a big, a big, very big surprise to me. Well, I fought the fatigue, yes. Living with, with cancer... It's really hard, especially with the lockdown and pandemic. You can't get a massage for your body to relax or unwind or like to go someplace else so you can unwind and not think about the chemo or what you're feeling. Because um, with um, chemotherapy, you'll never know what you'll feel every after the session. So um, I was lucky enough that I didn't have that, that much side effects. I was able to stay with the kids during their online school, ran with them when they were bike and doing Ironman kids. Iron kids, that's a virtual run. I didn't stop working out, but I wasn't consistent. I prepared my body by making it stronger for the next parlor visit. Um, uh, I started 30 minutes on the bike. I got so tired, so I needed a nap afterwards. But the next session got longer and longer until I biked for an hour and 30. While in treatment, then I noticed that my body still getting stronger each time I did that. Um, September, come September 2020, I got even to swim two to three sessions before my oncologist restricted me, given the last four cycles of my um, chemotherapy will be stronger. So I called my chemo session my parlor visit since it's just like a drip session. So um, that's what I always tell myself if I have a chemo session. I wanted everything to be positive. Like I want to associate the word chemo on a positive note. Um, it was hard to see all my hair fall all over the place. I started to feel 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 sick and look sick, and I really that I really had cancer. My husband helped me shave my head. He shaved his and my son too. So I was really touched by his gesture because at that time he was only five and he he knew how to support me, even though I didn't say anything. Um, he he was there for me. I got the best support group, my best friends, my family, and my husband who forever supported me when I finished my triathlon and when during chemo. He never missed a race nor a chemo session with me. November 30, 2020, I finished my, my last cycle. Finally, I graduated and then I called myself in remission. But I gained 20 pounds and I couldn't even run 10 minutes straight. I had to stop every five minutes, then walk for a minute, then continue running again just to finish that 10 minutes. That's at 6 kph at that time. And I was like super tired. I'm an active person, so feeling weak um, and heavy really made, made me sad. So um, December 2020, I started um, consistently working out again. I got my pre-cancer weight back two months post-chemo. From running 6 kph, I can now run 30 minutes at 16 kph and four hours on the bike. So I told myself, I can't let it define me. I know God has a plan for me. We may not know now what it is yet, but he has a bigger purpose for us. He has a reason for everything. So last March, I did finish my first Ironman post-cancer 70.3. <laughs> Thank you and a few races here and there. I know people will label you and pit you like, oh, she has cancer, she had cancer. But the fact is we're still living. There's no weakness in any of this. The diagnosis, the disease doesn't have to be a definition of who we are. So that's why I dedicated my race to my cancer friends, cancer sisters um, last March. Um, I, and to hope that to inspire them to be active and fit and don't give up and don't lose hope that even if we had cancer, we can still bounce back. We can, 
we may have put our lives on pause, on hold, but we can resume and fight hard to get it back again. So never lose hope and faith because that's what we have left. Don't let anyone take that away from us. Always choose positivity and always be happy, especially the outlooks, your outlook in life because that will help you so much, especially when during treatment. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, like, wow. We're both shy, but only she went, was able to go through Iron Man, you know? And here I am, pretty proud of the 15,000 steps I take each day. And I am nothing in comparison to her. Congratulations, Sheila. And thank you also for for sharing that line about uh, about that thing about your husband being there for you because husbands are the people that we women can want to live without but cannot my husband's my husband was threatening to put up a counterpart of i can serve foundation an organization for men he said at the receiving end of their wives cancer so um no, but, but really, I mean, what a wonderful, wonderful story. Iron Man is a woman. With nerves of steel. Now we go. Okay, so uh, Sheila uh, paid tribute to her husband. Now we go to um, a person who defies cancer like anything, who's managed to survive cancer despite that husband. <laughs> so please welcome, very, very dear to us, Marivic Bugasto. Thank you, Miss B. Um, let me start by, oh, if you're looking at my outfit, it's because I come from the mountains. This is a gada weed. Good afternoon. Um, good morning to those on another timeline. Uh, it's an honor and privilege for me to share my cancer journey and everything that happened after the diagnosis. I had fibrocystic breasts. I will tumawa. And I was diligent with the annual ob checkup as my family has history of cancer. It was in June 2005 when my doctor saw, my ob saw, in the breast ultrasound and felt during the clinical breast exam that the persistent breast lump then seemed to be bigger as compared to the previous year. And also, the feel of the skin was different. She then referred me to a surgeon who recommended excision biopsy and other lab tests, which thereafter showed malignancy. So I was diagnosed breast cancer stage one. After discussions with family and doctors and considering history of cancer, the decision was that I undergo bilateral mastectomy. Too aggressive, you say? But you see, breast cancer posts a serious threat to women in my family. Of five sisters, only one has been spared. And so in July of that year, I lost both breasts, and in December, all the spare parts down under. I went through three surgeries and countless other medical procedures in a span of six months. 2005 was really a very tough year. My thoughts then were, OMG, I have lost my femininity. And really, 
Physically, I just felt so mutilated and broken. It got me into depression too, like Alia. But one day, you know, like if you have all those fresh pa in your body, um, I couldn't even bathe myself. That my younger sister, my younger sister, who was headmaster of a school, had to come to the family home to bathe me. And it was one day uh, when after that shower, I looked my, at myself in the mirror and I smiled at myself. My dad said, oh, go check on your ate. I think she's losing her marbles because I was smiling. I was smiling back at myself. These were the eyes, that is the nose, and there's the big smile. <laughs> By the middle of 2006, I was given a clean bill of health, and during that time, I tried all I can to have my life back, to pick myself up and put myself back together again. Sadly, though, by the end of that year, the cancer reared its ugly head again. At that time, I experienced unexplained bone pain that didn't improve even after pain medication. The bone pain was also accompanied by weight loss, decreased appetite, and fatigue. A bone scan and correlative test showed that the cancer had moved to the bones. I thought I was a gunner. My heart stopped a bit the first time I saw my uncle write down the prescription, the words, breast cancer, stage four. So on the 10th of February, 2007, I had my first of six chemo cycles. Friends, this is what breast cancer stage four looks like. I am still whole. But under this outfit are the scars from losing both breasts and all the spare parts down under. My bones are brittle and weak. A PET scan in 2019 showed stress fractures almost everywhere, and I have had to contend with the lesion in T9. Incidentally, I forgot my body brace. Um, so the pain is there. But you know, something like this has really been keeping me up the past few days. Only this morning did I ever complain. After treatment of the bone meds in 2007, I had another scare in 2010 when another lump grew in my armpit and my cancer markers were high. But then that time, it only needed surgery and God's amazing grace to turn it around to normal. Yes, for the past years, everything as you see is normal, but I am always in terrible pain. And the usual cancer fatigue often feels double, even triple that sometimes I could hardly get out of bed. There are days when my feeling would be, good Lord, please take me now. Then there would be days that I feel great and then assume a very confident posture and say, bring it on, Lord. Nothing can stop me now. Most days, I live between the two. I have learned to live day to day, treat the pain when I need to, rest if I want to. But more often than not, I'd rather keep going. It's been 17 years and counting. And again, I say, only by God's amazing grace. In between those years, 205 until today, like I said, cancer is so friendly with my family. I lost my dad in 2011. I lost my son in 2014. 10 months and 23 days after, on Christmas Day, I lost my husband all from cancer, but I am Libra. Oh, 
I am forever grateful to everyone who has been with me through the whole experience. It is not a walk in the park. I often complain and whine about some extra weight, my aching joints, and the many limitations for cancer patients and survivors. But I consider myself lucky because despite chronic pain and fatigue, I am doing just fine. A frequently asked question from new, from new patients is, is their life after cancer diagnosis? Like I said, after and during surgeries and treatments and choosing to set aside grim thoughts of dying, I tried all I can to have a life. This was during the period before the discovery of the bone metastasis and, you know, like from stage one, upgrade to stage four. On my eldest sister's advice, I sought out for a support group to help me better cope. That was then that I joined Mindes Bodies Cancer Support Group in my home city, Baguio. We would have the usual meetups amongst patients and observe the sharing of each one's cancer experiences coupled with the spiritual journey somehow spreads positivity and really help in the struggles each one faced. However, in my heart, something was lacking. As fate would have it, an active member of the support group who was invited to an activity here in Manila could not make it. She was a professor at the UP Baguio and there was a conflict in her schedule. I gladly came to attend the first patient empowerment seminar hosted by ICANSER Foundation and Avon Philippines in September 206. And the rest, as they say, is history. It was attending that seminar where I was initiated into a very special sorority, a sisterhood of breast cancer survivors. And it was there the first seeds of advocacy was planted in me. Yun ang pinaka aha moment for me. It was there I realized that the, that the fight against breast cancer and other women's cancers happens on many other battlegrounds, not just the hospital. To save lives, we must educate women about the best ways to prevent and detect cancer early. I vowed I would do everything I can possible to help inform and educate the people in my mountain city. Most are indigenous women, and you know, they fear hospitals and doctors. Doing so, and by doing so, help them, the women and men, make better choices. Um, it was in Baguio where we first introduced male breast cancer survivors. I also realized I had the mission to share my personal cancer experience a story of survival is also a story of hope. And sometimes, like Sheila said, hope is all that the person needs. A book, some sort of a manual, was given each participant at that seminar. And the I Can Serve website was introduced as well. In one of the articles, I read about the significant learnings of Ms. Cara Likpala. Um, the founding president in her can cancer experience saying, and I quote, the cancer survivor is one of the best kind of people I know. Ask me why. She, <laughs> she continues to say, when you face death, your life takes only two meanings, love and service, and you pursue it with tunnel vision Every cancer survivor I meet is in a hurry to give back what is called paying forward. All cancer survivors I know, I know are filled with hope even when vital signs run low and their prognosis is the worst kind. In fact, the more advanced the cancer, the more the survivor glows with optimism." End of quote. So very true because when I think of the late Noni Padilla Marzan, I fully understood what Kara meant. Noni organized and founded Minas Bodies while battling breast cancer stage four then. Noni passed away on Mother's Day of 2004. 
She used up her last two years for others as she visited and comforted pediatric cancer patients. I used to read um, articles about Noni. And you know, um, Kara also has the same story because about someone else. I was also in awe of the courage and strength that Noni Padilla showed. After her first bout with cancer, she lived as if there were no more tomorrows. And when her cancer returned, she quadrupled her efforts. And well, I told myself, I want to be remembered like that too. When I went back to Baguio after that seminar, I was beaming with passion and vision for change. After a meeting where I re-echoed re what I learned in the seminar, I was elected president of the group and have held that position since then. Although many times I would have wanted to give up the post and they keep saying, you will be president until death. That started my work in the breast cancer awareness advocacy. I chose to be an advocate, although, well, I always rant when I call Kara because many times it is frustrating, but ultimately I have come to believe it is a truly noble calling because it enables me to help and serve others. My work in that advocacy includes organizing breast cancer awareness fora, arranging free ultrasounds, lab tests, and other such procedures with diagnostic clinics. I have partnered with surgeons for free clinical cancer screenings and on to no cash out surgical procedures in both the private and government hospitals. Through the various I can serve seminars and ad advisories, I have learned the term navigating patients. Um, what I do is being able to help choose a good medical team, introduce the patient to a survivor with the same profile in doing so providing her a good companion through the cancer journey, nurturing friendships even beyond the six to eight cycles, directing them to agencies and offices for possible financial assistance. I have received recognition for my work in the cancer advocacy. I was awarded um, outstanding woman leader. I was awarded Outstanding Citizen for Community Service. Yeah, bang ano. But you know, those awards are an encouragement to work harder so that we can have empowered cancer survivors to connect to other women who have been recently diagnosed and help them to shake off the stigma of the cancer diagnosis. We can have empowered patients who will take control of their medical care. And most importantly, we can achieve that goal of decreasing cancer incidence in our city. The recognition also humbled me in the same breath, and it has caused me to reflect. In 2005, I was staring out at the world I knew through rose-colored glasses. I was happy, I felt healthy, and I truly believed I had it all. Somewhere right smack in the middle of that charmed life, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And you know, when you're first told you have cancer, your mind goes on overdrive. Will my life ever go back to normal? Will I die? Thankfully, prayer and an unwavering faith carried me through. Family and friends also came together and helped me take both tiny steps and large strides towards recovery. New friends, whom I call my breast sisters, came my way that changed my entire perspective. Inspired by their stories of hope, I learned to welcome cancer, to embrace it, and I learned to accept it. I know that my sisters, my breast sisters, they too consider that cancer in a twisted sort of way has been a great blessing. To me, it is and we will always be part of who I am. Today, it still reminds me of my own mortality. On the other hand, it remains, like Arya said, a gift. 
that allows me fresh eyes to determine what is important and what really matters. Like I have mentioned earlier on in 206, and then being up upgraded to stage four, I thought I would die soon. If you would have seen me then, you too would think that survival was slim to nil. Yet, I am here before you today, a living proof that miracles can and do happen every day. My glasses aren't as rosy as those I wore some 17 years ago. They're crystal clear on some days, blurry on others, but there is a pink tint on most days that reminds me there is more work to be done, a lot of women, some men, and more children to help. I like my new view, I really do. So back to the question, is there a life after cancer diagnosis? I hope my story will be testimony that sometimes small individual efforts can play an important role in the lives of other people. And like Tara said, life after cancer is all about love and service. Thank you very much. I am Marivik Bugasto, to God be the glory. Thank you very much, Ambik. The woman is a 17-year-old stage four survivor. She will yet be a debutante <laughs> and get past that as well. You get invited to Baguio to, for a breast cancer conference. She is there in the hotel to meet you, to have you registered and checks you into the room. She is there when you do your speech in the venue, you get invited to Cebu, a plane ride away from where she is, two plane rides, and she is there with you, swinging her cane like she's about to do a tap dance. That's our Ambik Bogasto for you. I've never seen her not smiling. Even when she wears her mask in the time of COVID, you can still imagine her smiling behind her mask. Now, we go on to another story to inspire us also. Let's please welcome Dr. Anna Lisa Ong Lim. <laughs> It's really a privilege to be here with all of you. I know you all have amazing stories and being given a little bit of time to share mine is um, scary, but it's a wonderful opportunity um, to be able to recount a grace-filled journey with cancer. It's two months to 10 years for me this month. And um, thank you. And when I was diagnosed at the age of 45, I never really thought that this was something that would come my way. By then, I was a pediatrician. I was about um, 15 years post-training. I was a uh, faculty in the National University. And um, I was mom to four kids, the youngest of whom was just about to turn 10. Um, the days were busy with lots of work, seeing patients, teaching, um, doing a lot of consulting work on the side because aside from being in pediatrics, I was also working in infectious disease. And right now, the way I'm introduced is as a professor and a team leader in the university 
and also working with the government, um, particularly in the COVID response. But 10 years ago, a series of divine appointments allowed for my cancer diagnosis to come about. I was actually just making rounds on a couple of patients in one of the hospitals and happened to peek in to the room of a friend. And I said, maybe today's a good day to drop by and have this seen. Because I had been feeling a mass in my right breast for quite some time. So you'll think, but she's a doctor. Why did she get this checked right away? Well, you know, the perils of a double A cup size. By the time I felt the mass, it was about the size of the double A cup. And so I said, how can this be a mass when it's the entire breast? So in any case, I got to see my friend. He didn't happen to have any patients at that particular moment. So he had time for me to be seen and to chat. Of course, he said, okay, you need um, a mammogram and you need um, to get this seen. But um, you don't fit the profile. You're young. You, this doesn't feel like anything significant. But because you're a doctor and you know strange things happen to doctors, I want you to come in much sooner than the usual follow-up. And so I go down and try to see if there's a long line to try to get my mammogram. Again, another divine appointment. The lady at the reception says, Dr. Anna? Are you Dr. Anna? I said, yes. Do you remember me? You saw my baby a couple of years ago. And because that baby was um, a premature infant in the nursery, we hardly met. I think we actually just met once. Because when I was making rounds, she wasn't in the area. And so she says, don't worry. I'll take care of everything. So you know the powers of the staff. They get me in front of the line, get the mammogram done, and I'm on my way. And so the mammogram comes back. It's a little iffy, but the, the, my doctor friend says, okay, let's just take a look at this and um, keep observing very, very closely so we don't get any surprises. My life goes on. And uh, after a fairly long series of trips attending conferences, I noticed that, you know, this mass is growing bigger and something under my armpits is now there that wasn't there before. And so once again, another divine appointment. When I get back, I peek into the room. He doesn't have a patient. I finally decide, okay, today's the day. And so, of course, you know what happens. When you get something like that, um, it's not surprising that you're told you need surgery. You probably need a double setup. And there it moves forward. So being a doctor, I think, is a blessing and a curse because as he was saying this, my mind was processing everything, but the heart wasn't ready. And actually, it's funny because that day, I remember the kids were going to have uh, to end class a little early and so our family had decided to watch a James Bond movie of all things. Because it was day one of the show, my husband says, you know, we have to take, we have to get tickets ahead of time. And so they're in the movie house watching their, watching the clock saying, how come mom isn't here yet? And so I get the call. They ask, what's happening to you? And I said, I'm in the parking lot of the grocery. I can't go up because I was crying my eyes out. My kids, um, the eldest was probably in first year high school, I think at that time. Oh no, no, sorry. The, the youngest was um, um, still in elementary. He was in the last year of high school. And my two other girls were um, in, early, in early high school. So I have four kids and they were quite young at that time. So we go on to um, having these conversations that were quite difficult because it's challenging to be able to share something this um, profound with the kids. 
But you know, 10 years down the road, I asked them, you remember during that time when I was diagnosed, what did you feel? And they said, like nothing changed. And so in a way, I was offended because why was that? I mean, I'm here, I'm going to die, and you're not even impacted by the story. But you know, maybe thinking about it another way, maybe we did do a decent job, and they felt that life was going on despite the diagnosis. So journeying through cancer therapy was, of course, a challenge, as all of you know. And um, again, being the doctor is a double-edged sword. You have all of these resources available to you, people that you cross paths with, but you don't really consider to be your uh, best friends, are all ready to help. And as Mambi Bet said, it's the first, first night of your wake. I really did feel that. You just have everybody, anybody, ready to be with you and journeying with you throughout. And so many other gifts and graces came my way. Um, there were instances where um, the financial resources that we needed to go through therapy just really I would say hulug ng langit, and I don't know how to translate that. Just literally fell from, from heaven. Um, I was actually the first patient to receive um, pertusumab um, as the, um, on a commercial basis. Um, you know that um, many uh, breast cancer patients have to undergo um, monoclonal antibody therapy together with chemotherapy. And the standard by the time I was diagnosed was to combine uh, Herceptin with chemotherapy and perhaps radiotherapy if necessary. Because I was already stage 3 when I was diagnosed, I had to have the works. But in the midst of talking to several oncologists, they did tell me that, you know, there's another monoclonal antibody on the horizon and you might want to be part of the clinical trials. And so being a physician, I said, hey, that's a good idea. I'll get the supervision that I need. I'll be very closely monitored. And there's the science behind this. It makes sense. But just as I was about to sign into the clinical trials, another physician relative said, you know, why don't you try and access this drug so that you don't have to be, you don't have to take the chance of being in the placebo group. Because typically in the clinical trials, you don't really know where you'll be assigned and you are taking a chance. So in any case, we contacted the suppliers. They said, well, if you can get authorization from the FDA to be released this drug on a compassionate use basis, we'll try to find the drug for you. And so I wrote the letter, got a response within the week, the product manager for the drug really went all out to get the medicines for me. And an investment we had made several years ago just happened to appear and covered the entire cost of the second monoclonal antibody. So these things, now that I'm thinking of them again, really just show, I would say, the hand of God throughout this journey. And I hope fills the other people who are listening here and online also with hope that even as we are diagnosed, we're not alone. We're certainly always in God's hands as we journey through this particular disease. So now, I am two months to 10 years as a cancer warrior. Most days, I don't even think about cancer, except when my arm is painful during the day or when I take a bath and a missing part of the anatomy happens to be obvious. But 
when I'm asked about my medical history, what do you have? Oh, only cancer. Nothing else. I'm pretty healthy. Um, I don't exercise, which is bad, and don't follow me. But, um, well, we should all learn from Sheila. <laughs> but um, it's really been um, an amazing gift-filled turn of events. People say that cancer is a death sentence. I think we've heard from the ladies here that it certainly is not. And I know you all know that too. Recently, uh, in the past two years, uh, there's been a lot of work going on with COVID. And I don't really know whether that was part of the plan to give me a few extra years. But whatever it is that God has in store for us, after we're diagnosed, I'm sure it will be amazing and it will be a blessing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Anna, a pediatrician. I like pediatricians. My late brother was a pediatrician. Uh, when, I, when I had cancer and uh, he was trying to make me feel better, he said, we don't know what life has in store for us. Um, for all you know, I may go ahead. He was younger than me. And sure enough, before the vaccines came around as a frontliner, COVID took us, took him away from the family on April 8th of 2020, because he had, he wasn't wearing a mask when he was talking to, to the mother of a COVID patient. And then he said, you don't understand. As a doctor, there are times when you have this gut feel to take off your mask because that's the only way that you can confront the hysterical mother of a patient. Doctors, what would we be without doctors? And it's a good thing that Dr. Anna only has cancer. Me, I am hypertensive. I have asthma. I have diabetes. I have cancer issues. You can call me the woman who has everything. Uh, so, uh, I, no, I'm not crazy. That's what I don't have. Um, okay. Our afternoon will not be complete without our getting to listen to the president of I Can Serve. More of a man than any other man you've ever met. Bearing a man's name with pride. Please welcome our president here in I Can Serve, Nikoi de Guzman. So good afternoon, everyone. Let's get the introduction out of the way. I often introduce myself as a single daughter who became a single-breasted single mom with a single child. I become easily remembered because of that. Sometimes I even say I'm the most single person you'll ever meet, and everyone would surely agree. I was first diagnosed with stage 1 breast cancer when I was 28, fittingly during Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I underwent modified radical mastectomy of the left breast on October 16, 2002. Just when I thought everything was fine and dandy and have become used to the single-breasted life, I had a suspicious slump that I discovered early 2015 on my remaining breast. Not knowing whether it was benign or malignant, I took a leap of faith and decided to have another radical mastectomy on March 16, 2015. Looking back, it was a good decision because that lump turned out to be malignant. So, from a single daughter who became a single-breasted single mom with a single child, now I'm a fabulously flat, fierce fighting mom with a fantastic son. 
since I'm already the third generation in my family to be diagnosed with breast cancer, it wasn't that a big shock. It wasn't hard to accept. As a matter of fact, I didn't even cry the whole time I was at Makati Med. During the time, my doctor called me and my parents to tell us of the biopsy, biopsy results and that my left breast had to be removed. The second time around, when I was told that the breast removed was also positive for cancer, I simply said, so it's, it's back. Time to fight because I'm winning this battle again. Sorry, cancer. You picked the wrong girl to mess with because she ain't giving up. I had the same surgeon as my mom, the Dr. Raul G. Forrest, at that time, Makati Med's medical director. So just imagine the trauma, not on me, but on my dad's part, who after 25 years entered the same doctor's office, sat on the same chair, saw the doctor pull out the same book to show where the lump is, and hear the same dreaded words, I have very bad news, you have cancer. I only cried when I saw my son Yahoo at home. He was only 10 months old and was actually the one who accidentally kicked me on the breast. And it was so painful, I almost dropped him, which in turn prompted me to see my doctor. It's really different when a single mom thinks of her child. I can't say that I was expecting cancer. No way. But it wasn't like, well, my, mom, my maternal grandmother got it at 50. Mom got it at 40. Then me at 28, almost 30 and again at 40. Yes, it's scary because it was like we were getting diagnosed 10 years earlier than the previous cancer victim in the family. Still, I'm thankful I got breast cancer at this age because I believe my recovery was faster. Not to mention the drive and inspiration that my son gave me. He was only 10 months old during my first diagnosis, so I was really telling myself, Hey, Nikoi, you got to get well and you really have to fight it with all you have because your son depends on you a whole lot. I know it's an old cliche, but if there's something that breast cancer has taught me, it's that life on earth is short. In my case, I had cancer twice, so I think it has become shorter. So make the most of it while you're still alive. You'll never know what or when something as terrible as cancer will hit you, so while you're still okay with the Lord's guidance, and as long as you're not stepping on someone or hurting anyone, do what makes you fulfilled and happy. This go-getter attitude bit me once again in July of 2008, led me to try out Bikram Yoga. As a breast cancer survivor who was juggling motherhood and being a managing director, I extensively read and researched on the benefits brought about by yoga Hence, my decision to try it out for myself. In the spring of 2011, I flew to Los Angeles, California to pursue that Bikram Yoga teacher training course. And after nine weeks of intense training, I am now a certified Bikram Yoga teacher and studio director of Bikram Yoga, Quezon City. And if this ain't enough, in between my two bouts with cancer, I also got certified to teach yoga for breast cancer survivors kids yoga, chair yoga, and of course, the dance part has to come in at some point. A Zumba instructor, a kids Zumba instructor, a Zumba gold instructor, a pound pro, a generation pound pro, and a Nirvana fitness instructor. Yes, the learning never stops. And again, of course, we got to remain beautiful. So I also got certified in makeup artistry on both conventional and airbrush makeup. If there are those who went up the corporate ladder, I would like to say I went up the foundation ladder. I started out as one of those quote-unquote plain members of I Can Serve. Before I knew it, I was being given tasks and to head the little things in our events. And then there was one day that I was just called by Chrisanne and Lani, we all miss her, to, just to tell me, you know, Nikoi, there are many companies that would like to partner with us. Can you head the collaboration part? And yeah, I said yes. <laughs> then before I knew it, I was vice president and head for, for collaboration. 
and now your president of the iConserve Foundation. You know, <laughs> though not primarily a support group, but more of the of um, advocacy group, as most of you know about I Can Serve, the fellowship we have in all our gatherings and how passionately we work for our Barrio Spread projects to increase awareness about breast cancer is of a different level, truly a sisterhood like no other. Things get really crazy during October with something happening almost every day be it a talk like this, a launch of our own products to benefit us, a fitness activity, selling of our own products, all the list goes on, but we won't trade it for anything in the world. And today, I can serve as an online community of hundreds of breast cancer survivors, mostly Filipinas located all over the world, Saipan, US, Sweden, Saudi Arabia, and here in the Philippines, Baguio, Cagayan de Oro, Davao, Bacolod, and Cebu. Because of this community, we have a pool of volunteers like myself to do the work that we do in cooperation with non-survivors. Many of, the, of them are own family members, friends, office mates, doctors, and medical teams. I can serve as a lot of collaborative efforts with various groups, all with the end goal of bringing out the message of early detection to more Filipinas, and we work to provide hope and concrete help to women living with breast cancer and to those at risk. And ultimately help mothers, daughters, sisters, and friends be together for a longer time. So yes, like what has been said earlier, there is life after cancer. Why be sad or lo siang just because you have cancer? It's actually a chance to begin again, reestablish yourself, or something like a rebirth. As for me, it is hard to make plans. I just live each day to the fullest and continue to be the best mom, managing director, dancer, choreographer, makeup artist, yoga teacher, fitness instructor, and breast cancer advocate that I can be. I strive to embody Proverbs 31.25. She is clothed in strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. Let me finally end with a, with, a, uh, with a quote that I tell my students after each and every class I teach. Dance as though no one is watching you. Love like you've never been hurt before. Sing as though no one can hear you. And live as though heaven is on earth. Again, my name is Nicoya de Guzman. I had cancer, but cancer never had me. God bless us all. Namaste. Wow. I should really just take my bag down the stage and go home. There's... As we, as, as, we, as we like to say in, 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 in Tagalog, uwi na, may nanalo na. Thank you, thank you very much, Nikoy. Now, um, we have, uh, we have a, a brewing storm, so um, we're going to make things go faster. I have a question. Uh, Alia is here because we're, there are questions if there's practical um, advice for patients experiencing mental health as well as other emotional issues during breast cancer. Alia, can I have a mic? Hello. Hello. Yan. Funny you should mention that, B. I am he, I'm very, 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 very proud to present uh, practical advice, baka mo. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the new Breast Cancer Patients Manual. Okay, the, the I Can Serve Breast Cancer Patients Manual, a labor of love by our team. Okay, uh, she's not here right now, but this beautiful cover is Mrs. Abigail Arenas de Leon. This is June de Leon. Cancer survivor, beautiful cancer survivor. So um, we put this together over the last couple of months, posing. Okay, anyway, yeah, so we worked on this very hard, asked some of the people here, na talagang balikan ng balikan yung corrections. Um, 
And the night, the best part in true I can serve fashion. This is online. This is one hundred and fifty thousand percent free. You can download this for free. Any group that wants to download this and revise this a little bit to fit your needs, wherever you may be, can do so for free without asking. You can just say, now you know, we copied this from I can serve Manil. <laughs> but uh, I think the link, if you have the link, it will be available on the. Uh, Southeast Asian Breast Cancer uh, Symposium website, as well as the iConserve website. So, uh, photo finish, but we're very, pr everything is here. Everything you can think of from mental health to sex life to pregnancy to what you eat, what you don't want to eat, the exercise, everything. We thought about everything, so pretty much. So, we're very proud of this. We also cleared the. Uh, Cleared it with some. You see, you can see the people who worked hard on it, so they're jumping around. So uh, we cleared, uh, we cleared it also with some of our experts. So I'm very proud of this, and uh, it's written with love, layman's language. Everybody can uh, get. This is the cover, and yeah. So thank you. Uh, every anything you want to ask, it's in there. There's some. You mga nagtrabaho na Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Alia, I I have a. I have something, a question for Nikoi. Can you please um, pass the microphone to her? Nikoi, we've seen how important it is in our journey to find your tribe, your community. In your experience, how important was this sense of sisterhood? Yeah, I cannot discount the fact that, you know, all of us won't, won't be here if we didn't have a sisterhood something that's something like you know, I can serve in the whole sisterhood here of, of survivors. And I'm just thankful that we are in the road to healing because of this of this sisterhood. And we're just game with anything. Life is just, you know, we're just out there really going going for everything and anything. After this diagnosis, we feel, you know, we're like super women already. And then with the support of everybody, we we know that we can do more. All right. And um, yeah, just to cap off everything, we still, I was still a uh, able to um, really pull out the talents that the Lord has given everyone. That despite our sickness, all right, I was able to task the various groups that we're working with. Okay. I made the, in, in Tagalog for our foreign friends here, I made them utos. All right. I was like, I want to end this this whole uh, CBAX thing, uh, this whole symposium of ours, on a happy note. All right. And uh, I will be putting down my foot as president of I Can Serve. And I want all of us to really celebrate life. All right. So again, the dancer in me came out also. I made, uh, told them, here's the music, here's the choreography. I want everything to I want everyone to join this community dance of ours. All right. And because of that, this is our finale. Ladies and gentlemen, hold my hand by the Philippine Cancer.
Okay, so for a day that went so well, I know that um, Psalm 23, 4 is actually saying that even though we walk through the valley of the darkness of evil, we are comforted because we are in the presence of God. But in this case, to respectfully paraphrase it, even though I walk through the valley of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Friends, nothing ever happens by coincidence. I Can Serve Foundation was founded by Kara Magsanok Alikpala. Her name, if you spell it with a C, Kara means friend. Okay? Now, Having breast cancer is not a stigma. If the corrupt and those who steal from government coffers can behave like they think they are going to heaven, heck no. Having breast cancer is not a stigma. Earlier on, when we opened this segment of the day, I said that I used to think that hope springs eternal from the human breast when the human breast is one. Thanks to people who have lost both their breasts, we now know that hope springs eternal even when the human breast is gone because we are more than our breasts. And as proof, next year, we are going to be in Vietnam for stories of hope. And hope, if you invert the word, means foe. We are going to have a lot of foe in Vietnam. See you again, breast sisters. I love you all. Okay, group photo. Everybody on stage, please. Mind I'm right.
Our talk, uh, may we call on our speaker, uh, 2007 pa uh, President uh, of JCI Perlas Pasay, Melby Baldovino. Hi, Pipi Melby. Thank you, SG. Hi, guys. Familiar ba kayo dyan? Hi, survivors, friends, and relatives. Hi, Perlas ladies. Good evening. Sana safe kayong lahat. 
I hope everybody is okay despite the flood, the rain, and kanina ng umaga. May lindol pa, di ba? So, kwentuhan lang tayo with gratitude. May mga tissue paper na ba kayo sa tabi nyo? Hindi ko kayo pa iiyakin. Hindi ko kayo pa iiyakin. My name is Melody Valdovino. I'm the 2007 past president, married with one son. I am a 10 years breast cancer survivor. God has brought me through it all. We have a family of breast cancer. I lost my mom at the prime of her life. She was only 50 years old. Alam nyo ba, my nanay died on New Year's Eve. Dapat masaya, di ba? Celebration of new life. Pero kami na matayan. In fact, I question God. Why? Why me? Why my family? When my mother died, her doctors talked to me. Sabi pa niya, mag-iingat ka, iha. Cancer is hereditary. You have almost 15% cancer in your body. Upon hearing that and having that gullet inside me, I told myself, you are only a doctor, but not God. But after the 90 days of my mom, I tried to look for a breast cancer support group whom I can talk to and answer my questions about breast cancer. And that's the Eye Cancer Foundation. Carla Simpson, Carla Simpson, sorry, invited me to attend the launching in one of the restaurants in Bainville. Di ko alam kung buhay pa ba yung restaurant na yun, sis Carla. That's when I knew that Vivette Ortesa, Cara Magsano, and to name a few, di ko pa sila kilala, mga personalities, also are breast cancer survivors. I also tried to look for a breast surgeon. In short, naghanap talaga ako ng pinakamagaling na doktor. And napunta ako kay Dr. Diana Kuwa of Makati Med. Sa inyo siguro kilala niyo siya. 18 years after my mom died, my journey of breast cancer started in June 2011. The day that I discovered a lump, damungo lang, ganyan lang in my breast. Ladies, if you are in the shower room ha, at nagsasabon kayo, make sure na raise your hand and medyo press your boobs around your kilikili also. Kasi ako, upon touching that lamp, ang lakas ng kabug ng dibdib ko. Ang dalam, ang alam mo yun, I can't even remember the name of my surgeon. Kung, hindi ko siya maalala kahit nasa mobile, nasa directory ng mobile ko. So what I did, I went directly to her clinic and right there and then, sinabi ni Dr. Kokua, uh, we will get some tissues from the breast for biopsy. So sige, ginawa agad. Ganun siya kabilis eh. Mabilis siya eh. And then so two days after, tumawag siya, kinakabahan ako, please come to my clinic right now. So for me, additional stress yun, di ba? So I called my friend, Gretchen. Nandito sa Zoom now. And it was Gretchen who heard everything about the findings. At first, I was devastated, scared, and numb. That, that time kasi ang alam ko, healthy ako. Arte-arte ko sa pinakain ko. And I have a healthy lifestyle. I go to gym every other day kasi free naman sa office namin. I'm a runner, an active member of running club in our office. Diba, IPP Kati, nandiyan si IPP Kati. Si IPP Kati kasi 21K talaga tinatakto niya. Ako, hanggang 5K lang, pagod-pagod na ako doon. But still, I'm a runner, diba? But instead of giving up to that trial, I am confident that I'm going to make cancer the best things that will ever happen to me. Not the worst. And I would get through because of my faith. Cancer is such a frightening word. 
it's certainly not something that you can ever be prepared for. Bubulagain ka na lang. Alam nyo, to visualize it to you, tumbling-tumbling ako sa kama, iyak ako ng iyak, wala akong pakialam kung may nakakakita sa akin. Gusto kong kumawala from that takot that raised through my body when Diana ko confirmed her findings and words, filled my head with blah, 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 cancer, blah, 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 mastectomy, blah, 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 malapit ka nang mamatay. Pero alam niyo yun, sa sobrang arty ko, all I could think of that time was, what about my hair? How haba ka ng hair ko, di ba? Sobrang arty, arty nga eh, di ba? Mamamatay na lang, niisip ko pa yung group ko. So, once I got over that shock, medyo, medyo, nakalma na ako. Niisip ko one million times. While I was not sure if I would survive, I was confident talaga that I would make the most of this, and I would, I would make, I made a conscious effort talaga to do what I could to make sure that I would have the best possible chance of surviving to help others who would follow after me. Walang susuko, hmm, di mo ako kaya ng patumbahen, di ba? Kato na the result of my biopsy or pathological diagnosis on July four. 2011 was breast cancer stage 2A. I was instructed that the lump be removed agad-agad. But I opted for a later date. Date, sabi, tumawad pa ako. So, Doc, pwede ba? So, I can think twice as I am making one of the most important decisions of my life, di ba? Pinayagan pa pala ako ni Doctor mag-travel, I think, sa Korea. Still, in, the, in denial pa rin ako that I have a breast cancer, I opted to consult different doctors, ah, different doctors' opinion. Dapat kasi may second opinion, may third opinion, maliban pa opinion ng mga kamag-anak, opinion ng friends, hanggang malilito ka na, na rin, di ba? Litong-lito na nga ako noon eh, until I ended up with a medical expert sa St. Luke's. Uh, yung dalawang doctors ko, pwede kong pangalanan kasi in-invite sila. My surgeon is Dr. Cecilia Pagdanganan and my oncologist is Dr. Charity Gorospe. Galing niyan. Uh, so confirming with the initial finding, findings done in Makati Med, the doctor, ako pa nga sabi ko, Dok, ulit mo ulit, biopsy mo ulit ako, yung pala hindi pwede yun. <laughs> so the doc, gusto pa ako magpahiwa ulit kasi hindi pa ako sigurado. So, the doctor scheduled my mastectomy operation on August 6, 2011. Of course, kami ng mga cancer survivors, hindi namin malilimutan yung date na yan kasi that's our birthday. So, before my scheduled operation, my family scheduled for a priest from Don Bosco to administer to me an anointing of the sick. So, lakad kami nun sa loob ng chapel. Sabi pa ni Father, ay mukha naman wala kang sakit iha and then he started praying for me and assured me that uh, everything should be and, and everything and all my worries to God to surrender di ba? So, so yun kalmahado na ako sa mga kababaihan dito you will agree with me that one of the precious parts of our bodies are boobs, see, right? Right? For me, a certified guy, I agreed for a pictorial with my two boobs, see, ganyan. Nakagubad ako. It was done artistically, sabi nga ng mga artista. And dinala ko pa yun sa hospital when I had my operation. So during my operation, my family was with me, isang barangay kami. So, and true enough, during the operation naman, I remained calm and calm. All throughout my operation, I was holding on to the rosary da, which was blessed by Pope John Paul II. So, ito na girls. Dahil alam ko na makakalbo ako, before, before the first chemo, I tried to cut my hair shorter length. Ito na yun. And, uh, per, para hindi masakit, di diba? But, after a month of treatment, 
yung shoulder length na hair ko, unti-unti nang nalalabas, at unti-unti na rin akong nakakalbo. Later, papakita namin yung process na yun. Ha. And yung pinakamasakit is, yung pagbangon mo, dun sa mga cancer survivors dito, makaka-relate kayo. Eh. Nakadikit na lahat sa una ng buhok ko. So, I decided to shave. I was kalbo for nearly eight months. And I had never complained of bad hair day kasi wala akong buhok eh. But as a certified PK, nag-invest talaga akong bumili ng mga bandanas, dapat terno-terno sa damit ko, and bag, ganyan. So I wore hats, di ba? Yung fashionista, ganyan. Nag-i-enjoy din ako mag-apply ng makeup. Eto, I applied fake eyelashes, yan o, di ba? And I tried to learn how to draw kilay because kilay is life. Agree ba kayo? Yes. <laughs> yeah, may joke pa pala ako. Uh, di ba nga, nag-arte ko, nag-sombrero ako, nagmamaganda ako. And then one day, when I went to Walter Mart, uh, nilipad, nilipad yung sombrero ko. So nakita nila kalbo ako. From then on, I decided to walk bald. And be beautiful, sabi lang. Lakasan lang ng loob. And be grateful na rin. Ah, may advantage pa yan kasi, di ba, pag kakain ka sa restaurant, pinapaupo ka. Kasi kalbo ka eh. One time pa, on my way to PCSO, kasi pumipila ako doon eh. Kailangan kasi 5 o'clock in the morning, ando na ako. Alam nyo ba yung taxi driver? Sa sobrang awa niya sa akin, binigyan niya ako ng Santo Nino and 1,000 pesos. Sabi ko, Kuya, I'm okay. Ipagdasal niyo lang po ako. For me, uh, breast cancer is a wake-up call. Before being diagnosed, my work was very stressful. Alam niya ng mga taga, ka office mate ko dito, di ba? It's demanded long hours, ang suplada ko, mabilis akong magalit. But, nisip ko naman, during those years, talaga, mga healthy talaga naman ang kinakain ko. Bakit sana ako nagkamali, di ba? When I was diagnosed with cancer, the support of my friends was really invaluable. Sobrang importante ka sa kanila. Nag-uunahan pang dalaw. That, that's one uh, nice things talaga. Kasi ang alam natin, pag may cancer, malapit na yun mawala. Mamamatay na yan, ilang buwan na lang. Di ba? So, ma- nag-uunahan talaga ang dalaw ko. Siba? At that time, my son was in secondary college. He was the person whom I told about, the last person whom I told about my sickness. I could feel that he is in denial also, pero nararamdaman ko na nalulungkot din siya. He doesn't deal with medical issues and I knew I had to prepare and be careful of the words to say and my condition. I knew I needed to be strong for him. Diba? Ganyan, uh, si Arky, pag may anak, parang unahin mo muna yung, ano nila, yung needs nila. Perlas ladies and cancer survivors, friends, I am a positive person from the start. Actually, day one pa lang, I have talked to my cancer. Sabi ko sa kanya, cancer, you are not welcome in my body. The treatment will kill you. My family, friends, and doctors have been a big support to me. I am blessed to have, have you all, have you all standing beside me. This is si Sister May Ann noon, email pa lang tayo nag-uusap sis, di ba? Sinasagot mo na ako, may mga encouraging books na pinadala sa ako. Thank you. Life is short, brothers and sisters. Ladies, ito pa. The cost of the operation and the treatment was one of our major problems. Pag may cancer ka, parang lahat ng savings mo mauubos talaga. The firm where I work was very supportive and they told me not to worry about my financial problem and I should focus on my recovery. And then God's provisions continued. The network of, fr- of friends from JCIP, I can serve foundation, co-workers, my boss, Perlas Pasay, PPs like 
Ay, Pipi Kati, grabe yung ginawa niya sa akin. Lahat ng friends all over the world, no? Talagang tumulong sa amin. Pipi Smile, Pipi Leia, Pipi Farah, Madam Agi, Madam Lulu, Madam Lavi, Hazel, Sharky, and all of them. All of the Pipis. Thank you very much for the big help to me and my family. The cancer, my cancer, akin yun eh, hindi sa inyo. My cancer is very invasive. That's why we needed 19 sessions of treatment, including that herceptin. Ito yung pinakamahal na gamot sa may nakasurvive ng cancer. Ito yung pinakamahal namin gamot na herceptin that cost at least 130,000 per session every 21 days. Whew, I am blessed that I managed to get a monthly financial assistance from PCSO through National Press President Nabil Mamba. Thank you, Madam. Through the help of my doctors, Charity Gorosque, Ms. Cara Magsano, of I can serve. Sister Carla, thank you sa inyong lahat. I was able to avail of the 40% discount from that pharmaceutical company, which is the distributor of uh, Herceptin. Friends from outside the country, through the help of IPP Kati and PP Smile, lahat yun, talag talagang lahat nag-contribute for my treatment. Thank you. For 10 years, nabubor na ba kayo? Okay pa ba kayo dyan? Okay. For 10 years, during my treatment, I've seen the lives of women who are undergoing the same trial. In fact, nalungkot ako sa mama ni past President Farah. Diba? May isa pa tayong si Madam na isang namatay. De eh, dalawa na sila. I've seen sisters who have gone ahead of us. I will never, never forget what I have gone through with cancer and what other women go through with this cancer sickness. I firmly believe that everything happens to us for a reason. I believe that it happened to me so I can help others. Alam nyo, cancer can, alam nyo, cancer can and does happen to all ages. Meron ako nakilala. 20 years old, my breast cancer. 30 years old. Diba? Walang pinipili. But as I have learned, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a death sentence. I have survived this far. And that I'm very, very proud to call myself a survivor. Before, when I was bald or calvo, and then people would stare at me, I would just smile because I knew deep down in my heart that I would be able to he head up, to hold my head up, sorry, and probably say, hello, sabi na ng mga bata, hello, I'm a breast cancer survivor and I'm one of the strongest women in the world and in the universe. Diba? Pang Miss Universe. During the time I was recovering from treatment, I also I found myself soulfully comforted from all the worries by religiously attending masses at Greenwell Chapel. My joke pa ako. I remember I remember pala ha, when I'm praying in front of the chapel. Pag alis ko sa chapel, sa sobrang lutang ko, iniwanan ko yung slippers ko para akong nasa bahay. Pero naisip ko, hala, nagtitinginan na sila. At ang dumi-dumi na ng pa ako. So, binalikan ko yung sleepers ko. May mga daming patawa, di ba? Pero, before hindi ko yun makwento, kasi pagkwento ko, iyak na ako talaga eh. So, my faith and devotion to Saint Padre Pio greatly helped me during and after my treatment. And until today, although I'm still... Although I still have worries, takot, di ba? Taray, taray factors pa rin ako. Factor lang pala. However, I strive to practice every day the kind of person that God wants me to be. 
I have seen my son graduated from college and now in his fourth year in law school. Uh, with God's grace, I continue to build strong relationship with God. Today, I could be from God's healing power, being a cancer survivor for 10 years now. Cancer has taught, that, taught me that God really makes all things beautiful in His time. My faith helped me to stay strong, and my friends really encouraged me, never give up. If you have cancer, keep your spirits up. Dami spirits, ano? Walang susuko, ah. I know that sounds mayabang, yabang-yabang naman ito ni Melody, di ba? Para nakasurvive lang, eh. But really, don't stop laughing. Don't stop loving dyan sa mga single, ha, di ba? Don't stop living. You can win the fight. Remember and remind your family and friends that every day is a gift from God. The diagnosis has changed my life forever as well as my family. I want to encourage everyone who faces cancer right now that there is hope along the journey to never give up and hold on to the faith or to our faith in God. Baka maborn na kayo, pero meron akong favorite, uh, favorite uh, gospel dun, kay Matthew 18 verse 21. So, hindi ko na lang babasahin, pero parang sinasabi doon, sinasabi niyo kasi. Lord, how many times should I forgive myself? I, I doubt you. How many times should I refrain from resenting you in trials coming to my life? The Lord will say, I'll tell you, Melody, not seven times, but 77 times. Diba? Dapat nung forgive tayo, dapat wala na yung, yung galit yung una sa kwento ko sa inyo, diba? Nagalit na galit ako kasi why my family? So, kasi when we forgive, kasi diba, we free ourselves from galit and hatred, diba? Sabi nga ng mga bata ngayon, chill, chill lang. The Lord will say, tell, I tell you, Melody, from 77 yes. times, diba? tapos na tayo doon. So, yes. sabi ko sa inyo, I am still a uh, work in progress. I only knew that I only knew that God is faithful. I am happy to share my journey and God has done for me. I glorified Him for His God of love, mercy, and compassion. Ladies, and sa lahat na nasa Zoom ngayon, friends, friends from Cebu, from Manila, from Quezon City, from Makati, ladies, from Fairlast, thank you. Today, lahat kinakain ko na, everything na masarap. My favorite crispy pata, hindi ko na yung pinapatawa. Hmm, yummy! Diba, shrimps, donuts, chips, chocolates. Basta in moderation lang, ha? So, gusto ko magpasalamat to the people who had taught me lessons in life. And I want to thank God. I have you, people in the Zoom. Perlas Pasay, ulitin ko ulit, my friends, past presidents, thank you sa support, I can serve, Corridor of Hope, hindi ko alam po nakapasok ang mga doctors ko, where I continue to experience blessings of belongingness sa inyo, of simply having a sisters, di ba, may kapatid, may kapatid ako, may kapuso ako, may kapamilya ako. Three in one, di ba? Again, I hope na na-inspire ko kayo sa story ko. Life is beautiful the second time. Maraming maraming salamat. Thank you everyone. Thank you guys. Pipi Mende, should we play the video? Yes, please. At mayroon na akong tip mo na ito yung binibigay sa amin sa I Can Serve and sa no, Corridor of Hope. Ladies, para sa inyo to sa mga young pi kasi may mga bata dito sa group natin ah. if age 20 kayo dapat please do a monthly breast self examination kayo lang habang nasa banyo naliligo ganyan or age 30 naman kayo same pa rin mag breast uh, self examination have an annual clinical examination by medical doctors if nag office naman kayo mayroon naman tayong annual examination di ba 
and 40 above must continue to have breast examination, annual clinical examination with the doctors, and the mammogram. Medyo hindi lang mas, medyo masakit po ang mammogram, pero it's okay. It's okay to be okay, di ba? Past President Lavi.
Ay, group picture, baka mawala yung iba. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Yes. Ayan. But we can also ask some reactions from yes, our please. audiences. I can see some. Medyo <laughs> nanit, kahit ako po medyo naiyak-iyak. That was very inspiring. Meron po ba tayong uh, reactions from our friends and audiences? <laughs> baka magkaiyakan na po ulit. <laughs> Sige po. Sino pong anything? Uh, yeah. Ako may ask. Yes, they asked. Hi, PP Meldy. Yes. Thank you for inspiring us, inspiring me personally. No, I was a witness to her very challenging journey, and uh, I remember Meldy. Meron tayong isang event sa ano bang lugar to sa may Green Belt yata. Iyon ay yung ano yung naghahat ka na, no? And alam mo, I, I remember my thought process, Meldy. Sabi ko panalo talaga tong si Meldy, no? Despite her condition, lady, she was attending functions ng Perlas. And she was very supportive. So, nakakatawa siya because she was really uh, a beacon of hope for everyone. Um, Meldy, siguro isang question lang. What was the lowest point in your journey? And how did you overcome that? Ano yung parang, parang yung point na yung bibigay ka na, pero paano ka nag-bounce back? Paano mo nilabanan yun? Ah, ito yung ano, yung I had chemo and then, uh, kasi hindi ako naniwala na sabi mo wala ng paklasa and everything. So, arti-arti ko, nasa chemo treatment ako. So, bago, kuma bago pumasok dun sa treatment, kumain ako crispy pata kasi merong restaurant dun sa, 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 sa global. Favorite ko yun favorite ko si Pata. Kain na ako nito kasi baka mamaya wala na akong panglasa. And true enough, pipi, love. Pag uwi ko sa condo, siguro after pagising ko, kasi mga 12 ako nag-chemo. Pagising ko, wala na. Lasang kutsara, lasang steel, lasang ewan. Ganyan. So, I realized, ano, um, Life is short talaga. And I hold on to God. I hold on to my faith. Kasi yun lang eh. Yun lang yung kakapitan mo. Kanino ka pakakapit? Kakapit ka ba sa dingding? Hindi ka naman niya matutulungan. Di ba? Kay God lang talaga. Kay God lang ako kumapit. Minsan, hindi naman ako makikitang paladasal ako. Hindi naman ako ikitang rosary ako ng rosary. Ganyan. But my faith really is very strong. And... Uh, Thank you that I have you guys, I have you ladies, na uh, hindi nyo nakitaan na kahit na <clears throat> kahit matinda ko ng function. Iyak ako, no? Ako ng function, minsan longga ng kumain, but then I have to see. Magpipretend ako, ang sarap-sarap ng kinakain. Diba? Para lang, hindi naman lahat kayo affected, di ba? Ako lang, ako lang naman ang may cancer. That's it, baby love Thank you. Thank you, Melds. I, I, I really wanted to highlight that kasi nakita ko yun, Meldy. I know you were in pain, pero you were very supportive kaya sobrang saludo ako sa'yo, Meldy. Sobra. Mara you, you represent ikaw talaga, sobra. Saludo ako sa'yo. I, I, I saw you yung time na yun eh. Kaya I just wanted the younger ladies to appreciate that. Na, you know, here is someone na alam mong may sakit, alam mong may iniinda. Pero hindi, go, go, go. Beautiful pa rin siya, why not? Kompleto head to toe, di ba? Kompleto sa sombrero and all terno kung terno. Sabi ko nga, okay pa si Meldy. Kapala yun, no? Ikaw pa ba, di ba? Thank you, Pipi Meldy. Di ba? Oo, di ba? Nakakaloka to si Melz. Ikaw, okay to si Melzi. Yeah. But God bless you, Melz. May reason. May reason kung bakit ganyan yung journey mo, no? And 
yeah, there's really a reason for everything. There's a divine calling. God bless. Thank you. Sabi pala ng doctor ko, Doc, first time ko mag-talk about my journey. Kasi before, every time, hello, I'm healthy. Iyak na. Hello, I'm a breast cancer. Iyak na ng iyak. So sabi niya, naku, ano na yan? Wala na yan today. Kaya mo na yan. Kayang-kaya mo nang ikwento yan without. Uh, kala ko nga hindi na ako iyak. Pero umiyak pa rin pala. So thank you. It's okay to cry, PPBLD. You honor the feelings, di ba? It's okay to cry. We love you. God love you bless. Do we have any more questions? I think our direct team, do you have a question? Pwede pa mag, ano, mag test, mag test to mo ni dito na. I would like to share with you. Siguro mag mark ng pearl. Alam ko yan, Pipi. For Mark Nakorlas, I would like to pay tribute to people who have uh, passed on. And Melody was among those who bridged their journey. So, uh, gusto ko lang i-name yung mga Perlas Pasay past uh, associate members natin who passed on. Unang-una na si charter president natin, si Lorna Verano Yap who passed on due to uh, brain cancer. And we have uh, Lenny Martinez for pancreatic cancer, uh, Tessie Kalisay for cardiac uh, cancer. Cardiac cancer. Kikita Tessie. Heart. Oo, pero nag-umikot-ikot siya, di ba? Iba-ibang uh, parts ng ito. Um, Melody was an inspiration, a part of their journey nung they were going through that before they passed on. So, I guess uh, they're not here, but uh, I'm sure they would want to thank Melody for the time that she she gave her hand, her time for them. Maraming salamat for that. Thank you, you forgot Ellen Magtira. She had abdominal cancer. She was also oh. past president. Ah, okay. Ellen, did you meet Ellen Magtira, yeah. Oo oh, nga pala, no? But, yeah, yeah. Abdominal cancer. Yes. So, mga... Meron pa lang ganun, cancer of the heart. It's a, rare, ano, it's a rare entity. Actually, Madam, I remember um, Tita Tessie telling me na uh, kasi she was diagnosed in Canada. Eh. I remember she was diagnosed in Canada. She was hospitalized there. Buti na lang, she has insurance. Pero the insurance would not pay because ah uh, Parang there's no, ano, there is coverage. A rare, kasi, no, yeah, there's no coverage and it's a rare entity. They were telling her na, uh, you have cancer, so this is parang, parang, not naman fraud. Pero, kasi di ba, parang, she was complaining of parang, hyper, I think parang hypertension or chest pain. Uh, parang mga ano lang, for for cardiac ano lang, but not cancer. But they found out that it's cancer, cardiac cancer. And it's very, very, very rare. Mm, okay. Gee, all the while, akala ko, ah, dito lang banda sa may ano. Well, anyway, yun na nga, because nakikita nila si Meldy, you see, until the very end, di ba, ladies, you saw all of them, their spirits were always up. And Melody was like the anchor for all of them. Just for you to know, Melody, na to the very end, kaya nakakasmile sila kahit na yun na nga, alam nila yung pinagdadaanan nila. Yes. So, Salamat. Thank you, Madam. And I think we have another question from Directin. Directin? Here? Yes. Yes. Hello po, Pipi Meldi. So thank Hello. you for 
for sharing po your ano your journey with us. Ay, sa lang po lang. Lang. It's on video. <laughs> so, hindi yeah. lang pangit po po. <laughs> no po. Ayun. So, uh, I really saw po yung parang bond niyo po talaga dito sa JCI for Las Casa. It's really different from the other organizations that I've joined and it's really inspiring na we're also part of the Perlas family. So I just have a question for, kasi I have some relatives din who have cancer. Breast cancer. So do you have advice for like family members like me? Like, paano po ba usually, paano po ba kayo sinuport ng family nyo or yung emotional support nila during your journey? Can you share with us din po yung parang uh, support system nyo when it comes to your family? Maybe that can help us as well as we're coping while we're supporting our titas who have cancer in our family. Right now. Oh, I'm sorry to we are not here. Um, actually, pag may cancer ka, syempre, yung first ano mo talaga is your family, di ba? Sila yung una mong pinagsabihan. So, sama-sama kayo. Oh, not only for the financial, di ba? But, of course, yung spiritual and wala eh, kailangan, kailangan unang support mo, manggagaling. Family is family. may outside support ka like yung may mga group na organization like sa cancer kasi may mga may support group din kami so yun yung sobrang laking tulong nila sa akin sobra alam mo yung isang email lang eh may ah, nandiyan padala ng libro ganyan kakapal paano ko babasahin to so parang ma-inspire ma- ka lang di ba tapos laging may email may group email tapos lahat ng ano ba to ano ba to ah uh, during my treatment na di ba magtatanong ka paano ba to sumasakit yung isang sugat ko ganyan bakit yung isa suma- hindi naman nasugatan parang ganon. so lahat yon i think yung maliban talaga sa family is yung yung support group mabuti i have i have i can serve foundation i have perlas si perlas minsan naiiyakan mo di ba lahat yon lahat uh, dapat um, and of course teen kay God sabi ko nga sa inyo kanina hindi naman ako t- yung tipong dasal ng dasal laging sa simbahan o laging talagang uh, ganon ganon but my faith iba eh ganon iba iba kasi naman tayong tao hindi naman nila nakikita kung paano ko magdasal hindi naman nila nakikita but then faith from God the support group and of course your family walang iwanan teen in fact minsan 1,000 na lang ng pera ng buong pamilya. Yun pa, ibibigay na lang nila lahat yun. Tapos susupport nila para may pambili ka nila. Thank you, Tin. And if my concern ka about breast cancer, sige, tutulungan ka namin. Ang daming nasa live. Ang daming nandito sa Zoom. Ang dyan yung president ay I can serve Cebu. Ang dyan yung I can serve uh, Manila. So, sige lang, Tin. Lapit ka sa akin. Thank you. Thank you very much po. Thank you po, P.P. Melty. Gusto ko mag-hi sa atin yung taga Cebu eh. Gusto ko ba siyang, okay lang ba, sis Mean? Isa ka sa mga, alam mo, sobrang idol ko yan. Isa yung ganda-ganda niya. Ba alam, ito yung magkikita kami. Nakaka-struck. Nak- diba? Mel, yeah. congratulations. You finally told your story. Yung uh-huh. parang ano eh, graduation mo. After so many years, 
nasabi oh, ko na, na kwento mo na. Actually, um, kami ni Melz, yun na nga, I, can, I also started with I Can Serve. And parang yun ang glue that kept all of us going through the same, well, more or less the same uh, journey sa cancer. So, alam namin hindi kami nag-iisa. Yes, we have our family, we have our friends, pero iba pag ano, pareho kami ano, sakit, yung so, cancer. We can, we can ask anything we want to ask. And one thing, kaya nga I can serve, it stands for Information for Cancer Services. Kaya lang inaabuso namin, nagiging I can eat, I can dance, <laughs> I can shop. Lahat na lang ginagawa namin. Life is too short eh. And the first time we met Mel's was during an I can eat. Uh, mm-hmm. Daladala ko, kasama ko, sila Ron, andito si Ron, si Myres. Um, some were new in their journey. Si Mel's naman, medyo... Hindi ka na new nun, Melz, eh. Pero mm-hmm. ano siya, eh, bubbly, lumapit siya sa mga bago. And nag-pay it forward siya. She was also inspiring people by saying, this will pass. This is, uh, breast cancer is the most treatable form of cancer if detected earlier. Kaya kami ni Melz appear, stage 2A kami. A for good conduct. Yun lang yun, hindi kami C. A kami. Good conduct kami ni Melz. So like Melz, nakalbo din kami. We all went through that. One of these days, you also invite uh, Ron or Myris. We all have our story to share. Pero kanya-kanyang story. Gaya ako, I was diagnosed, no history of cancer unlike Melz. But fast forward, five years ago, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. So ano yung mantra namin? Like daughter, like mother. Hindi na like mother, like daughter. <laughs> Like daughter, like mother. But in anything we do, you know, the reason why we're still here, Melz is here, Myres and Ron, hindi pa tapos yung mission namin. So every morning we wake up, buhay pa kami, thank God, what are we to do now? So we continue advocating early detection for breast cancer in any way we can. Hindi naman yung hard sell. As much as possible, we, we want to put a face to survivorship. So I'm very he- I'm very thankful. Melz is now the phase two breast cancer survivor for JCI Perla. Please abuse Meldy. Her story <laughs> is worth sharing. Abuse her. Tapos pag face to face na sa video niya, sayaw kayo ng line dance ng I will survive. Yun yung ano namin eh. Yeah. National <laughs> national anthem I will survive. So, yeah. in, 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 in life is too short, sabi nga, sabi nga ni Mel, uh, some passed away and you all paid tribute to those who passed away. Um, it's all in God's plan. Whatever stage you're given in That's your right. cancer, it's, it just, this is what we put no, psychologically. It's just a basis for the doctors to treat us. Meron stage 2, made stage 3, stage 4. And we can prepare for what we, well, we can prepare for the eventuality. Fera na lang yung iba, nasagasaan o wala. O yung na-crash na, na aeroplano ng mga sundalo, wala. They were taken by surprise. But we are so blessed to prepare for the future. Yun lang amin. We, we are prepared for it and we celebrate life each day. Yun talaga, we celebrate. And thank you for the friendship. Melz, alam mo, mahal ka namin. We love you, Melz. Yes, see you in Cebu. Oh, see you. Maraming leksyon dito. Oh my God, crispy pata. Maraming lechon, marami rin chicharon. Yes. Marami rin mangga. Dapat yun, last year, eh, diba? Dapat pupunta. O oh, dapat. Sa sunod, kasama ka namin. Diba, I can eat lang, tapos punta lang Baguio. Ngayon, nag I can eat kami, punta kami Taiwan. Tapos nag-lockdown. Dapat I can eat, tapos punta kami Korea. Yun yung mga, oh wala God. lang, mga girls outing. And we had, one thing in common, yun yung bond of cancer. But the bond became stronger kasi naging sisterhood like no other. And that's I can serve. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much. Love you, sis. Yeah, thank you so Love much. Love you more. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. Thank you, Pippi Melby. And to show our gratitude, we would like to present this certificate of appreciation to Pag-a-gay. our... This year, Perla's Pastor President Meldy Baldovino for sharing her time, wisdom, and experiences as speaker for Kwentong Perlas, hosted by JCI Perlas Pasay, held via Zoom, given this 24th day of July 2021, signed by Karen Pebos Baroa, 2021 JCI Perlas Pasay President. 
Screenshot screen lang po. Picture lang. Ayan. And then, of course, um, uh, we will have our photo ops. So, please open your cameras and you can switch to gallery view po. Ayan. And then, open your cameras. Okay na ba ang ating mga ano, smiles? <laughs> Medyo natiri-eyed po yata ang ilan sa atin. Nakita ko kanina sa screen. Ayan. Let me know if you're ready po. My uh, first photo, yung normal lang. Ayan, sige. One, two, three. And then, another one, uh, please do a uh, one sign. Yung ganito po ay number one sign. That's our monthly symbol for this month, for the month of uh, July. Ayan, sige. One, two, three. Ayan. Thank you so much, Vicky Melby. And also, in relation to that, uh, to our topic today, we also have a project called Strands of Hope. If you're familiar, it's a project direct, uh, headed by Direct Christel Nogar. It's actually a donation drive of care. Okay, and then, we have a partner po na Care for Hope. Sila po yung gumagawa ng wig. So, ang beneficiary po nito is yung mga uh, patients din po who are undergoing chemotherapy. So, yan. So, if you know, if you have uh, donations po, of somebody who is willing to donate, just contact us. And for the stands of and si direct Christel Nogar. Ayan. Thank you! Yeah. Nandiyan pa ba si, si Sister Carla sa line? Wait lang, Sisa. Nandiyan pa ba si Sister Carla? Wala. Are you talking about me, Melody? Yes. Mag-hi ka naman. Yes, I'm here. Hi, hi. Hello. Siya yung hi. Ano, nag-invite sa akin to attend the lounge sa... Wala mo, artista pala dun, sis. <laughs> artista ay mga kasama mo dun. <laughs> so, Meldy, thank you for sharing your story. So, you know that I lead the Speakers Bureau for I Can Serve. So, I can now invite you whenever we have any forums. So, kasama ka na sa Speakers Pool ko. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, I can serve. Thank you, Sis Carla. Thank you, thank you. Akalain mo, naka at avail ako ng 40% discount from that person. Yan, di ba? Pabalikan ko lang, ha? Ang oh, mahal-mahal na yung ladies. I need two vials of that. Ay, isang vial, 41,000. Buti na lang payat ako. What is mataba? Sabi niya, nako, magpapayat ka. Because you need three vials. So, magkano na yun, di ba? Then si, si Kara, galing-galing niya. Tinawagan niya yung informasyotikal. Maka-avail ako ng this. Thank you, I can serve. Thank you. Marami pa tayong matutulunan, Melvi, because our role is really to provide information to those, especially those newly diagnosed, so they can get the services, di ba? I can serve. Information for cancer and other services. So that's us. And thank, thank you to JCI Perlas for letting Melody share her story so that, you know, more people will know that there are, there's a support group out there who can inform others the correct way. Kaya yung sinare ni Melody na, a 20 years old, do your breast self-exam every month. A 30 years old, get an annual clinic. That's what, that's our, that's our main advocacy, early detection, because you never know, you can have no history of cancer, familial history of cancer, and you can still get cancer. So, napakahalaga po na. Thank you so much. Because our role is who can inform.
yung sinare ni Mel, napakahalaga po. Yes. 